Fantastic. Welcome, everybody, to the final session, shock horror, of this year's Responsible Raw Materials Conference. Yes, everybody, we've made it. We are here in session eight of eight sessions. And if anybody says, oh, by the way, there's a secret ninth session, then I've yet to get the memo. So for those of you who have been following us all week, congratulations. Um, you've almost made it. It's almost the weekend where you can sit and think, oh, my goodness, what is all of that amazing information that I have pummeled into my head over the week. I know I've been getting messages from lots of you over the last few days saying that you've got all of these tabs open, these links to different materials that the fabulous speakers have been suggesting. You've been re-watching some of the videos as well. And I know that lots of you are catching up later online as well, because, of course, 8 a.m. UK time is, is OK for those of us who are here in, in Europe and Africa and uh, and all of those lovely Asian places, etc. But for those of you who are in the Americas, that's slightly impolite, isn't it, asking you to get up at this time of day. So it's absolutely fantastic to hear that so many of you have been watching the recordings and catching up a little bit later. Absolutely brilliant. Now, what we're going to be doing today is um, we've got another fantastic lineup uh, for this final session, really exploring, well, exploring all kinds of aspects. And I'm going to let the wonderful speakers um, tell us what it is that we're going to be exploring very, very shortly. But we're going to attempt to finish off the conference with a bit of a summary and also a call to action. Um, I think those those of us here will agree that we go to, to these sorts of events and everybody has all these amazing ideas. I know that because this has been an online conference, well, I don't know, perhaps some people have been sitting there with a glass of something to induce those, those wonderful thoughts, um, but we haven't been able to sit there afterwards after those talks and think, hmm, this kind of sparked that idea in my head. Um, what is it? What is it that we're going to do about this particular area? And so what we're going to attempt to do is to finish off with a bit of a, a call to action um, and, um, and show you what as Responsible Raw Materials we plan on getting up to having been inspired over the course of the last week. Now, are these thoughts set in concrete or in rock of whatever sort we want to pick? Absolutely not. I think that they are very much still settling in our heads at the moment. And so we very much do embrace all engagement where possible. So with regards to all of that, what I'm going to do is um, invite our fabulous speakers for this morning. Um, we've got their cameras on already. We've got most of them here. I'm going to work around the room and invite them to say hello to all of us and what it is they're going to be speaking about. However, before I go to that, I have just been reminded. Um, for those of you who are new to the sessions, you will be very glad to know that there's a whole week's worth of free TV for you to be able to catch up on. And the place that you go to to find this free TV is, well, an easy place to go and start with is the website. And I'm sure Rose will put the website details into the chat at the moment for those of you who are on Zoom. Um, and those of you who are watching us on YouTube, you already know where to go. So here is the Responsible Raw Materials website. Um, and by the way, we do have a newsletter. So if you haven't signed up to it, um, please check it out now. It's really short and sweet. It's not something that's gonna fill up your inboxes every month. We just try and keep it kind of really short and to the point. Uh, but then go and click on the 2022 conference. Um, um, hopefully not too many more people will sign up today because otherwise they will have missed all of it. But you still can sign up if you really want to. Uh, we've got our nice infographic there. Um, we've then got the lineup. OK, so these are all the wonderful people that we've spoken to over the course of the last week. And of course, we're now in Friday the 13th, lucky for some, um, on the final session of the day. Um, if you then click on this bit here, abstracts can be found here, click on that button, which actually takes you through to our talks tab. And what you will see is there is a little um, article effectively um, for every single talk that we've had over the course of the last week. Um, and what we've done within all of that is, so for example, Johannes was with us on Monday, okay? So you will recognize and think, hmm, I have seen Johannes somewhere before. So click on that session. And what you will see is we've actually uploaded that panel session already into that area, which is great. There's also a little link in here and you'll see this responsible raw materials day one LinkedIn. And if you click on that, you will go to LinkedIn and the fabulous blog that Ludovine wrote attempting to summarize what we heard 
during that first session of the conference. And we've been doing this for every single session. So if you if you didn't manage to catch us on day one and you want to read about what on earth did we speak about, then go and take a look at these little blogs. We will be collating everything together into really easy to understand bundles um, at the end of today or over the weekend. Um, but basically, if you want to catch up on that, please do feel free to go and click on those links. Also as well, so sticking with Johannes, so Johannes is one of our brilliant speakers um, that we have today. So let's let me go here. And so I'm going to type in Johannes into the search function. It will have a little think. OK, so there we go. That was Monday afternoon session with Johannes. And then Johannes is also going to give us a talk. And so if I click on that here, we've got Johannes's abstract which is a work of art. So I encourage all of you to go and have a little read of this. We've even got a little graphic in there as well. You've got a biography for Johannes. And then after today's session, what you will see is we will add into this Johannes's video of his slot. So everything is in a nice, easy to use package. The videos are generally only 20 minutes long. So for example, those of you who work in say universities or you want to share this with people to get them to, to look at these videos as part of their coursework, everything is a, in a nice, easy to use bundle, which is brilliant. So in this talks area, if I just go back to the, the full talk zone, as it were, so we've got hundreds of talks in here because we've got everything from the last three years. OK, so we've got all of the talks. So um, we've been joined by what is it now, Rose, about 79 people over the course of this last week have contributed to talks. So that means we've got a whole host of talks from this year. We've got talks from 2021 and 2020. We also have talks from some of the other events that we've done. So if you click on the previous events button, you'll see some of the other events that um, we've done with different groups. And for example, the Resource Reserve Roundtable, if I click on that there, um, we will eventually get through, here we go, into, um, so on Wednesday, we started off talking about some of the changes in governance with regards to how much rock you can say there is in the ground that is available for extraction. And we ran a whole series of roundtables with different people from around the world. Um, if this is the area you want to go to, go and take a look at this. And quite handily, because I know that I mean, being a, being a geoscientist, I think this area sounds absolutely fantastic. But for those of you who maybe aren't so excited about the rocks, you might think, oh, that sounds a bit dull. Um, there is a five minute teaser trailer. OK, so again, it's perhaps not up there on some of the most watched films on, say, Sky or whatever um, station you like to watch. Um, but do take a look at these. So there's a whole host of previous events that we've been involved with. And then finally, if you're still looking for material, click on the learning material button. Um, and in here you will see that there are a whole load of different links um, to a whole load of different materials that are pulled together from a whole load of different fantastic websites around the world. So really trying to pull together as much learning as possible with regards to raw materials, where they come from, how they're processed, how they're recycled, how we can actually make the circular economy a reality. So lots and lots of lovely material there for all of you. If you think that we're missing something, let us know and we'll put it up there on the website. We're acutely aware that we will have gaps. Um, this is not meant to be perfect and we're just trying to get the discussion going. Rose, is there anything else I need to say about the website other than how to find YouTube, which I will do right now? She's saying, no, I was reading her thoughts. Excellent. So if you want to watch all of this on YouTube, there is a big button that says watch live on our YouTube here. So click on that and that will take you to our YouTube channel. And again, you'll see all of the different videos from the last three years, plus a whole host more. Um, the one that you need for today's session is this big one in the in the top over here, which says live against it. So if you click on that, you'll be able to, to come in and watch us live on YouTube, which will be great. So stop sharing um, and come back into the world of Zoom. So for those of you who are watching in Zoom, usual rules and uh, regulations apply. So please have that chat box open. Please communicate with us as well. Share all your lovely ideas and your links. Absolutely wonderful. We want to get that discussion going. Um, if you don't want to use chat, you can use the Q&A and we'll be keeping a close eye on that and making sure we answer your questions. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, please do feel free to post your questions in the chat um, area. We're very, very, very happy to have your comments come in on that. 
And of course, again, we're keeping a close eye on Twitter and TikTok and LinkedIn and uh, smoke signals and carrier pigeons and anything else that you might use in order to be able to get your messages through to us. We have received questions via email over the course of the last week. And whilst they are a bit more difficult to keep an eye on whilst running all of this, do feel free to use that as well to get your questions through to us. So with regards to that, trying to keep everything as open as possible, if for whatever reason things start to go wrong because say the internet begins to die on us or somebody's really naughty um, and we need to kill the Zoom session, we will do that immediately and then we will send out new details to your email addresses. So if you hear the message from me saying we now need to kill the Zoom because of fairly obvious reasons, which I'm sure we will see at the time, look to your emails and we will send you through updated details. So we do have a plan in case somebody is exceptionally naughty. OK, so that's all of the background admin -y stuff out of the way. Let's come and meet all of our fabulous speakers who will be listening to in this final session of the Responsible Raw Materials Conference 2022, which is all about looking at the role of mining in the just transition, whatever that might be. Um, so coming to our fabulous speakers, um, Antoine, do you want to go first um, and just say hello to everybody? Who are you? And a little bit about what you're going to be speaking about. And then I'll go to Liesl. And you can't steal all of her thunder. So Antoine, do you want to go first? <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, pleasure being with you virtually today. So my name is Antoine Ati. I am the, the founder and director of Udula, which is a social enterprise that uses mobile technology to engage communities and workers in, in the mining sector and other supply chains. And we'll be uh, partnering with, uh, with Liesl uh, to, to explain how we do that and how we can combine machines and people to, for, for a just transition. Awesome. Thank you very much, Antoine. I'm so looking forward to your talk, you guys. It's going to be great. Uh, Liesl, do you want to say hello to everybody? And then we'll go to Johannes. Hi, I'm Liesl Pullinger. I represent Lean for Communications, where I'm the Head of Sustainability. I'm based in South Africa. Um, and uh, I have a particular passion for digital stakeholder uh, engagement in mining communities. And um, I'm looking forward to share a bit more about that with Antoine, with all of you. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much, Liesl. Going to be great. Uh, Johannes, do you want to say hello to everybody? And then we'll go to Phil. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Johannes Drielsma. I'm an environmental engineer with a background in mining. I'm working as an independent consultant these days based in Dusseldorf. And uh, my my experience, I guess, is, is engagement with the mine workers in the old way, uh, sitting in, in lunch canteens and, and talking to them uh, and getting their ideas. Um, the last 15, 16 years or so spent in what I call the Brussels bubble. So you'll hear me referring a little bit to EU policy later. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Johannes, from the Brussels bubble. Um, that's going to get really difficult to say later on in the day. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, Phil, do you want to say hello to everybody? And then we'll go to Emma. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Phil Bird. I'm a researcher at the University of Leicester, working as part of the Met for Tech programme, which is uh, part of the UK circular economy research um, and I'm going to talk to you today about technology metals and the challenges in quantifying those resources. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Phil. Fantastic. Emma, do you want to say hello to everybody? Um, and then I'm going to invite Ludovine to say hello. I know that she's busy, but we'll get her to say hello. Um, Emma, over to you. So I'm the Platinum Group Metal Research Fellow at Johnson Mathey. Um, who are also a part of Met for Tech? Um, because of the importance of that, um, where a secondary refiner, and, and I think I'm here today to give a platinum group metals and the um, ESG activities that we're undergoing for the just transition. Awesome. Thank you very much, Emma. That would be brilliant. Ludwig, do you want to say hello? And then we'll go to Zach. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Ludovine Vuters. I'm a governance policy and strategy consultant for mining companies and investors primarily. Um, also been doing a lot of work on mineral supply chain policy and how that links into the criticality agenda. Uh, looking forward to these discussions and to wrapping up the amazing 
a collection of ideas that have been floated this week and uh, continuing the discussion in various ways over the next few months. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Levine. Zach, do you want to say hello to everybody? And then we'll go to Rose. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, I'm Zach Wood. I'm a uh, director at DBK Advisory. We, uh, we work on turning a whole lot of internal financial and ESG data into information that can be used from a board level through to uh, community engagement, to government engagement, to a whole lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, and, and we do a lot of that is around trust building. And that's part of what I want to talk about today is around uh, this just transition and the, the trust building and the social compact that's needed and a, a bunch of other ingredients of a good word salad. <laughs> Excellent. Loving the good word salad going on there, Zach. Beautiful. And Rose, do you want to say hello to everyone? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rose. I'm one part of Responsible Materials. Um, I am a geologist by trade, but I've increasingly gone into sustainability. And um, throughout this week, I have been working behind the scenes to try and make sure everything works OK. So if I look very distracted, it's because I'm frantically doing something, not because I'm being rude. Um, very excited to hear all the talks today and to, to have the conclusions uh, later. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rose, for that. Absolutely glorious. So for all of our fantastic speakers that we have lined up for you this morning, if you guys want to be a part of a discussion, turn on your videos. Um, if you'd prefer us to leave you alone, just turn off those videos. Um, absolutely, totally fine. Very much respect that all of you may want to take part in some discussions and may want to sit out on others. That's, that's totally fine. Um, so with regards to that, just a quick overview of those sessions that we've had earlier on this week and then I'm going to pass straight across to Antoine and to Liesel and we might get started a little bit early which would be glorious. So just to build up to today's session. So on day one, um, the, the main theme really that came out of that session was really around, okay, how do we change the business model of mining and uh, the concept of talk versus walk. So how do we actually make it all very much a reality? Then into session number two, where we heard from people all over the world. So we had speakers from the Philippines, the DRC, Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, Europe. Of course, it was a morning session. So that's where our time zones were concentrating in South Africa as well. So a diversity of perspectives and also setting expectations. So how do we manage those expectations and set proper expectations amongst all of those different interested parties who have got something to do with that mining value chain and the full blown circular economy then into session three um and this is this is really where um we became very honest with ourselves actually and so we started off session three with the burst the bubble session which was just fantastic hearing from people who don't work within this sector at all um and giving their perspective as to as to what they think mining is and what their expectations of the sector are and again i mean it doesn't matter if you work in mining or you make batteries um what do they actually expect of all of us and that then therefore triggers a whole load of self-reflection and saying okay we need to be honest and we need to build trust with all those different groups so a lot of um perhaps that um that alphabet salad as as zach was referring to just then so that was session number three into session number four that started off on a very geoscientific note um but perhaps this was around okay how do we change the the mechanics of the full circular economy and actually viewing the fact that Mining isn't just an input, actually the mining and processing is perhaps the keystone of that circular economy. So we actually, we need the, the reprocessing or the recycling of those materials, as well as being able to extract the raw materials out of the ground in order for us to be able to have enough durables in circulation to do what we need to do for the, uh, for the energy transition. Into session number five. Um, and so this was from dinosaurs to donut economics, um, with a little bit of dignity thrown in. So it was the it was the three Ds that, and I think actually at the end of session five, that was where we ended in full-blown revolution with regards to that particular conversation, which was just glorious. Into session number six, um, and in session, session number six, we really discussed, okay, what kind of information do we need at each point in time? So coming from say exploration into the extraction, into the processing, into the design of those, um, the technology that we need into the recycling, et cetera, what kind of information is needed and the diversity of the information because not everything is financial. 
So therefore, how do we include all of that information and actually get that knowledge flow that we need in order to be able to make decisions? Um, and then finally into session seven, which was the, the one that we had uh, just yesterday evening. Um, and that really ended up in that concept of shared value. So what is it that we're trying to build here? Um, are we just trying to make money for mining companies or actually is this about development of society? And so again, actually lots and lots of links back into things like changing the business model, et cetera, as well. So that's where we've got to, just for our wonderful speakers for today, that shows a little bit of the journey that we've been on. Um, but that then tees us up perfectly to come to the wonderful Antoine and Liesl. So Antoine and Liesl, if you guys want to find those unmute buttons, um, and I shall gently bring you to the stage of our virtual conference that we have here. If you've got slides, go for it. Um, so everybody, if you please put your hands together to welcome from behind your muted microphones, the fabulous Antoine and Liesl. Thank you very much much. Over to you guys. <laughs> um, thank you very much, um, Rose, Sarah, Ludovic, and everyone working with us worked hard to bring this week out into the world. Um, I must say I have a bit of FOMO because, well, past FOMO because I was at, at the South African mining in Darbo the past few weeks. I came back um, uh, last night and I have a sneaky suspicion that they were a bit more thought-provoking thought shit yeah, than I was able to pick up where I was in person. So I will definitely be going to review some of the videos that you posted. Um, so uh, I've already introduced myself and so has Antoine. And today we we wanna we want to ask a question um, of the industry and say what 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 would it look like if we can bring mining stakeholder engagement into the digital era? Um, and I'm not just talking about uh, people on smartphones in in Europe or in Johannesburg. I'm I'm talking about rural people and people who, who um, might only have a very simple feature th a phone or um, not be literate. What, how will that change the dynamics in mining stakeholder engagement? Um, to introduce the topic, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about a, a project I had the privilege to be involved in. And we, I, I've learned um, quite a few lessons in digital stakeholder engagement. Um, the project was deployed in 2017 in rural South Africa in Limpopo province. And um, why the project got um, uh, was born in the first place was because there was serious trouble in those mining communities with information gatekeeping. There were stru uh, structures in place um, within the company, but also within the communities. Um, and it was not in their best interest that the normal stakeholder on the ground receive information in real time. So um, at that time, it was fashion to say, there must be an app for it. So um, that is what we did. We created a, brow a browser-based app that people with a very simple smartphone could, could access. But then, Big issue, uh, where will they find the data, the Wi-Fi to do this? So the company at that time deployed over um, 20 free Wi-Fi hotspots, less similar to what you would have in your home, and um, then uh, had a training program to show people the basic digital literacy skills that they would need to access this. So in, in that sentence, uh, uh, already, uh, can branch out to lots of lessons learned. But what I wanna, wanna stick to for the, um, for the purpose of this conversation is um, two, two observations. First of it, uh, the first observation is the incredible power of access to information. Uh, someone who's able to take his phone, his smartphone, his feature phone, um, and access an opportunity 
without having to rely on power structures or other people to provide that opportunity or to provide the information about that opportunity to them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, was an uh, unintended consequence of the deployment of this program and um, is a, a little bit on another topic, but it has to be mentioned because it was a revolutionary to see. What happens if uh, a mining company decides to make digital infrastructure available to the host community? Will they use that digital infrastructure to just um, badmouth the mining company on Facebook? Or um, will they actually um, try to actively improve their own lives and their own socioeconomic self-sustainability. And what we have found through this program and the data that we could generate behind the scenes is a resounding, I will use it to improve my own life. We, in the end, we had 36,000 um, subscribers or um, unique users. And over a period of 18 months, they accessed the opportunity tab or button over 1.6 million times. That's 36,000 people doing, just showing the sheer willpower and the sheer um, uh, desperation. Is there an opportunity for me that I can access here? So um, I think the time is right to bring mining, community stake, uh, stakeholder engagement into the, the digital era. Um, at the moment, we're seeing a few barriers and I'm, Antoine and I will speak about that a little bit later, but um, technology, software, uh, ability, the capability to do this is definitely there. And um, that is where uh, Antoine and the software that he's been um, working on and developing uh, uh, is, um, is just an incredible tool that we are able to harness to bring mining stakeholder engagement into the digital era. So Antoine, let me give you an opportunity to tell us more about Ulula. <laughs> so I, I think to, to give another, uh, you know, point to, to what, what Lisa was saying, you know, maybe some of you know that more people own cell phones than toothbrushes, and that may say something about our society, but it also just pragmatically tells you, you know, the opportunity that lies ahead of you when you want to engage through, through mobile phones. And so the, the, the idea is how do you systematize that and how do you adapt to, you know, all the, the context that mining takes place, which is, you know, as we know, uh, can be very last mile. So behind the idea of how do you tap into the billions of people that are uh, on, on cell phones, I mean, there are at least three things that we've been trying to do uh, to make it work, right? One is uh, that you need to go beyond, you know, smartphones. You have to be inclusive. Otherwise, you're just going to reproduce the, the exclusion and the fact that only the loudest mouth speak. And, and that's definitely not the idea. The idea is how do you democratize? The, the second is that, uh, as we know, sadly, I think mining can be a dangerous business for the people who, uh, you know, open their mouths sometimes. And there's been activists that have been on the on the wrong side of, of that in, in, in some places, particularly on the environmental side. So how do you protect uh, you know, people who speak up, the, the whistleblowers, the workers, the, the communities? And so anonymity is to be, has to be at the, at the fundamental of, of that. Otherwise, the data you get is and the communications are not going to be um, uh, trustworthy. People are not going to tell you what they really think. And the last thing I think that we've been really focused on is how do you make it two way? I mean, it would be ironical that the, you know, an industry that's called extractive also extracts data from people without closing the loop, right? And so uh, the, the the way it works is that you have to to really, you know, facilitate a two way conversation to create the trust and and give give some some agency to people. So, and how we've been using that, I mean, to give examples as. Uh, clearly, in the context of COVID, you know, when you can't uh, send your, your community relations people on the ground, or you have to renegotiate your environmental impact assessment, um, then I think that these types of tools have, have gained even more traction than before, uh, because we can run surveys and, and you know, con connect with thousands of people uh, at a very uh, low cost and, and very simply, So, so and, and do that more often. So 
that's an example. In grievances, I think is also a, a big example. And and uh, as you may have heard from other, uh, and we'll hear about the the Brussels bubble. The Brussels bubble has, has produced a directive on on uh, you know uh, on human rights due diligence uh, that that is, needs to be uh, you know, fully fully agreed upon. Uh, but you see that you know uh, having exercising due diligence, meaning having effective grievance mechanism, is becoming paramount for you know all 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 uh, businesses. Uh, but mining uh, being one that that is really at the core of that. So that's another uh, reason why you, it's it's really important. And just providing the data to uh, to empower people, whether you are a communication person trying to talk to your engineers or or communicating out to the to investors, I think has been really what what the what the technology can give you and something that we've been doing for eight years. So it's not you know it's not like a, it's not just a newbie on the ground. It's something that we have quite a few lessons learned about. So um, at the same time, you know, technology is just a tool. I, you know, it's not going to change uh, you know the fundamentals of of the power relations uh, per se. You have to to use the data. You have to make the best of, of that opportunity. And so that's why this partnership with, with LIFA and, and, uh, is, is really fundamental. And perhaps, uh, you know, before we can uh, continue with, with that. Um, th uh, thank you, um, Antoine. Uh, one of the, um, uh, I was speaking with um, uh, Danielle from the ICMM Social Performance on a panel at the Manning and Dava, and she she told this beautiful story, and the the picture just stays in my mind. So I want to share it with you, courtesy to Danielle. She was in Papua New Guinea, um, and she was outside the mining area, standing on a beach, and she was watching three or four women in a very precarious canoe paddling. And finally, she realized, um, paddling towards the mining area, finally, she realized what, she, what they were up to. They were holding this, their feature phones, their cell phones up so that they could embrace or harness the connectivity that the mine um, made, uh, made available only for themselves. And when she was able to talk to them afterwards through a, through a, um, a translator, they said, but that they went to do their cell phone banking on a precarious canoe in the middle of the ocean, trying to catch a signal. That is the power of being able to connect. And it was uh, through USSD. It wasn't smartphones or, or, or data. It was SMS-based. So Antoine um, shared the, um, uh, uh, the importance of uh, software is just a tool. It's as good as the data that we can feed it. It's as good as the activation or, or the implementation that we can give it. So, so at LIFA, we've been um, we've been taking a step back in in terms of reporting. I think that the mining industry, especially the big players, are exceptionally good at reporting upwards. They uh, push out glossies. It, it's it's beautiful, and there's um, fancy online portals for ESG information. But there's a huge gap. There there is only a hundred and eighty degree um, uh, reporting excellence. What about those people that are most affected by the impacts of mining? Not getting the same type of attention in terms of um, reporting on impacts, reporting on ESG parameters. From my experience, it's a resounding no. They're not. They, they are not getting the granularity that, um, that investors, et cetera, are able to harness from a website. And in, in, in mining host communities, who is becoming more and more sophisticated, more and more hyper-connected, when they open and they have enough data to open those same glosses, some of that is news to them. Or, heaven forbid, it, um, it contradicts the information that the mining um, community relations staff member gives them on the ground. So where's the truth? And what's the result of that? Trust is lost because the message is not consistent. So in short, 
Leafa 360 has a big vision, has a, has a dream to be able to make the ESG, the information about the mining company available with a 360 view. Same information that investors, et cetera, are able to see. How do we translate that into um, chunks of information that community members can receive in a channel that they are comfortable with? So um, when, we, when we talk about the Ulula LIFA 360 partnership, there's a few elements that LIFA 360 brings to Ulula um, that's needed for successful take or use. The first of all uh, is uh, a, a digital engagement strategy. I don't know how many of you have children in school, uh, but schools are notoriously bad with having a uh, uh, um, uh, integrated and comprehensive digital engagement strategy. I am on four WhatsApp groups for a, one child in one grade, and I have six children. So um, it would be a full-time job to keep track of all the digital channels. So same for a mining company. They need an integrated digital engagement strategy. And then uh, there must be some kind of implementation of these plans um, including on community level, which would take an uh, activation campaign to help them use a tool like Ulula and get used to it. And then um, very often, uh, and we'll get to this on the next slide, there's a sentence about it. When, when I talk to mining executives about using digital strategies in um, community engagement, they would say to me, but wait, we're going to give our power away. This makes us uncomfortable. We can't control the messages that goes out. And in, in that very statement, in my view, they are giving away their power because they're giving away an incredibly powerful tool to get data about social risk in mining. Because the same information that your stakeholders are able to give you through a digital tool, the same, um, the, uh, the, the, the same two-way communication that um, Ulula enables creates metadata or data about data that can indicate risk um, to, uh, to a mining company. And then I challenged them and I said, okay, guys, you mine of the future. I'm seeing the control room, oh, it's sexy, oh, it's beautiful. Where is the social dash dashboard in that mine of the future? The real-time stakeholder information that um, uh, we, uh, the technology is there, it can be generated, it's a matter of will. And then um, once the data is available and we have been able to really listen to our stakeholders through digital and face-to-face -face means and integrate that information into trends. What is this really saying to us? Is the relationship improving? What's the hot topics? What's the buttons, um, et cetera, and report that back to the company, but also to the stakeholders who's providing this data. Um, so on our last slide, we've just thought a little bit about what are barriers. If this, if we're live, living in a digital era, if everything is going into the fourth industrial revolution, what are um, barriers to um, um, to implementing digital stakeholder engagement. And Antoine, maybe you want to first highlight implementing this and then I can conclude. Yeah, I'll try to be brief so that we have questions because we're running out of time, I realize. So um, I think the first is, is really to, to emphasize the message that it's not about you know, substituting people. It's just that no company will be you know, ubiquitous and have ears and eyes everywhere at times. So it's, it's more like how do you gather intelligence so that you can allocate human bodies to the, the at the you know at the best time in the best places so it's not it's really trying to be smarter rather than to uh, to be distracted the, the the second i think is that you have this fear of losing control and and that 
the, the, the point is, you know, it's happening whether you like it or not, right? So the question is, how do you really get to, uh, you know, uh, create a, a dialogue that is more inclusive and not just have like the, you know, the anti mining and the and the and the, the, the PR machines, you know, affronting each other and, and trying to really foster something that's a little more genuine and, and and where you hear some of the voices that you would miss otherwise. So I think that's. That's that and the third, I think, is really what we already said is that it's not just about having a little app in Android or iOS. It's about actually the other the other way is going through SMS, through voice, to get to the literate people, to get to the people in their language so that we can hear them out. Because these are the people that are critical to um, to making sure that you know the, the, the impact that you are you're proclaiming to have is, is really going to be to be there. Otherwise, you're just leaving them behind. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liesl and Antoine. Um, so exciting what you guys are putting together here. Brilliant. Um, round of applause, everybody, for the fabulous Liesl and Antoine. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I've got I've got so many messages coming in at me from different devices at the moment. So so my my little um, smartphone, which, yes, has only works if I stand on one leg, sort of angled in a slightly northerly direction with the wind blowing in a certain way. Um, so with this and I know that the questions will come through to you later. Um, I'm loving the fact where there's a kind of translation or making making the information real for people. Has anybody done a study where they've kind of gone to the financiers and they've gone to different communities and everyone said, well, well what information do you think, you know, do you want? And then actually shown that to one another, because so often the financiers ask us for information. And we're like, why on earth do you want that? The real thing that you need is this. And that's why has anybody done all of that cross mapping of the information? I would love to see a study on that. But I think it happens in, in, in companies who use the GRI method of mm -hmm. uh, reporting when they do their materiality assessment. But it is not packaged in the way that you have asked the question. Yeah. Um, the materiality assessment is done on granular level. It's then take up to corporate where it's nice and sanitized. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then, uh, but... The, what you're asking is in there, but we don't have access to that. I haven't seen it packaged the way that you've asked it. Yeah, because it might just, I don't know, create a little bit of empathy between the different groups, if nothing else, um, which would be mm -hmm. really cool. Um, Zach, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I wouldn't say this is a broad, widespread study, but certainly one of the mines in Limpopo. Uh, did a great piece of work where they had um, they got local unemployed grad sorry I forget it's an international audience Limpopo is a, a province in South Africa sorry they're <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the big platinum mines they they hired local unemployed graduates to and gave them a uh, you know an iPad and and they hired them to actually go and uh, speak to each individual household individual household and capture what their concerns were about the mine. And the way they did it was they broke it down to two questions. What do you like about the mine? What don't you like about the mine? Um, and then, uh, you know, at that point, you get into kind of where, you know, where, where Lisa and Antoine are, are talking because they then gathered all that data and went through a whole process of saying, okay. And what was really great, it was that, A, they learned a lot about what people were saying about them and wanted to say about them, but then they, you know, it comes down to five or six things. It's always only a handful of things that are really big issues. And they could then go back and individually respond to each of those. So I'm conscious that's not a broad scale uh, survey of what exactly what everybody wants. But I think my point is, it may not be useful to do that either, because these, you know, communities are not monolithic, and, and they're certainly not all the same all over the world. They're not even the same village to village to village, you know. Um, but but that individual interaction uh, changed the way that they spoke to their communities. Mm. Awesome. Thanks very much for that, Zach. That's a great addition. Um, Johannes, do you want to come in? Yes, uh, I love your survey question, uh, Sarah. Th th this is really needed. And, and I'm, I'm aware of a couple of things that might have been done. So um, I will post links later. I, I have been involved in some research that was funded by the European Union, where we went as far as looking at what are 
some of the big clumps of stakeholders asking for. So we looked at global reporting initiatives. We looked at um, uh, mining certification schemes. And then we looked, for example, at um, the practice of life cycle assessment. And we, we saw indeed there is a mismatch. You know, the, some of these schemes are very much asking what the, what the uh, consumer on the high street wants to know. Um, and others are really focusing on what the host community wants to know. And they're not the same. So I can post a link to an to a open source paper on that. The other um, example I know of is, uh, again, funded by the EU, a research project that has um, put together a proposal for another certification scheme for the mining uh, of minerals. But they took the approach of recognizing that there will be different demands at different stages along the value chain. So they produced a set of four distinct standards that must be connected for the uh, mineral production to be sort of certified as okay. And so that's quite interesting because they will have gathered then um, that the requirements of each standard will be tailored to the stakeholders of each step in the value chain. And I would imagine there that you see a contrast. And when I post that link, you may see that there's an open consultation on that set of standards uh, with uh, comments due by end of June. So that's an opportunity for uh, attendees to, to engage and contribute. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Johannes. Um, Ludovine, I know that you want to chip in on this discussion as well. Thanks. I'm, I'm veering a little bit away from your question, but I just wanted to, to perhaps connect some dots. Um, you may remember in February, Rio Tinto came out with a fairly brutal assessment of its corporate culture. Um, I'm not pointing fingers at Rio Tinto because quite frankly, they put on paper what is prevalent across the industry and they did it in a very brave way. One of the things that really struck me is that beyond the, you know, the, the, the limited discussion, there was really a huge point that was made about a structural weakness in our industry, which is the huge silos and the complete disconnect from corporate headquarters to operations. And the fact that this allows little fiefdoms to, uh, to exist, which are really a law unto themselves. And um, I, I was particularly struck by what you were saying, Liesl, of the power of information to break down those barriers and to, to literally explode the, the sort of little power of, of little chiefs in their bubble because once you have information that's not only bilateral, but it actually becomes multilateral because everybody can not only come into it, but also come, you know, take something out of it. Um, I think that's one of the best uses for information. One of the sessions we had this week was about the fact that information itself has no value. It's how you use it that's important, that's relevant, that's important. Um, so so I'm, I'm trying to also connect the dots to the fact that beyond answering a need, this is a huge opportunity for a major culture change. And seeing as that element of culture has caused us, frankly, to be the worst versions of ourselves in many cases, um, I'm, I'm slightly hopeful from your presentation. <laughs> so that was just my two cents. And I can see that Antoine already has <laughs> things to add. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Ludovine. Antoine, let's come to, to yourself and then we'll go to Liesl for any final final comments. And then, and then Johannes will be on to you. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Brilliant. Antoine, over to yourself. Yeah, just to, to pick up on Ludivine's point. So I think there, there are two elements here that where technology provides like very specific value. One is, as you say, it's like it creates accountability through, you know, breaking the information silos. So you can have like corporate to site and then to third parties also that are maybe trusted by uh, by women in this case, and, and something that we do in many industries where what we found, for instance, is compared to sending an auditor to a, a, you know, a, a factory saying, you know, is there sexual harassment? When you use mobile phones, you get up to 30 times more detection of, of sexual harassment. And why? I mean, it's not about magic. It's first because you're not interviewing 20 people, you're just getting hundreds or thousands, depending on the size. And second is, like, if, if I show up with a nice suit and, and ask, like, are you being, you know, do you face harassment? you will not trust me and, and you will be much more truthful. I mean, this in psychological studies with your phone than with your uh, a, a stranger, right? And so 
they are, you know, the, the example of, of your team, as you say, it's just, it's brave, uh, and it, but it's something we see across, across many industries and many sectors. So um, that's where there, is, there are interesting pro- properties within technology that, that I think can make the, the voices heard in, in a more effective way and, and facilitate remediation at the end, as you say, you know, information is alone is, is useless. Is then how do you translate that into remediation for women in this case and for others in, in, in other uh, circumstances? Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Antoine. Great. Liesl, do you have any final comments? No, thanks, Sarah. And uh, thanks, Ludovine and Antoine. I think in that, in that vein, um, uh, for those who don't work a lot on ground level in in rural communities easy to underestimate the intimidation that is going on in mining host communities i think to use mobile phone technology um, that has an option of an anonymity to um, say what you want to say and not be put on the spot or intimidated has a huge potential to filter out the noise of intimidation, not just by the mine, also by structures within those um, mining host communities. Uh, Thanks again for the opportunity and looking forward to listening to the rest of the conversation. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Liesl and Antoine. Massive round of applause. Absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Brilliant. So moving on to our our next speaker, um, who you've all met already. um, So the fantastic Johannes. Um, So Johannes, if you want to come to our virtual stage, I'm going to post your abstract into the chat so that everybody can take a look at it. Um, And Johannes, do you want to reintroduce yourself and perhaps start with some opening comments? Round of applause to Johannes. There we go. (laughs) Yes, sure. So um, my name is Johannes Drilsma, environmental engineer by training and um, started my career with uh, the mining industry in Australia. Um, I've spent the last 20 years living in Europe and most of that um, spent representing the mining industry towards the EU institutions in what I called earlier the Brussels bubble. And so um, I think, you know, in my abstract, I'm, I'm putting together some ideas which were in part um, my impressions from the opening session of this week's uh, conference um, where I, I felt that um, I, I have attended a lot of events and a lot of conferences about responsible sourcing of raw materials, where from my perspective, an engineer having grown up on site, um, you know, there's a risk that we still get a little bit stuck in, a, in sort of high level discussions of uh, generalized, you know, generalizing things. Um, and, you know, this, this contributes to the idea of, of a bubble in Brussels, or maybe sometimes a, a Geneva bubble. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and of course, you know, this is a communication challenge and a, and a consultation challenge when we, when we speak to uh, you know, broad groups of stakeholders. But there is a tendency to sort of narrow things down to, you know, two word labels, usually an adjective and a verb or an adjective and a noun, you know, a, a sort of responsible supply, sustainable development, green mining. Um, but it feels to me that we've been doing that for a long time. And we might need to get down into some or more of the detail and break open some of these generalizations. Um, so a good example, I think, is when I attend events where people speak about what the mining industry should do. And I immediately have the question, well, who do you think is the mining industry? And how would we possibly influence the mining industry? Um, does it really only include industry or does it also include uh, informal mine workers of, of which there are many? Um, so some of these realities I think can spring up when, when we, we start to break down some of the, the generalizations. Um, and you know, probably the, the same is true when, we, when people sit in places like the United States or Canada or Europe and talk about other nations um, and, and what uh, mining countries need or should do or what host communities um, need on the ground without perhaps having visited the ground or spoken to people on the ground or interacted through apps. So I'm very interested in that uh, sort of discussion that we've heard this week about the need to, yeah, build trust, 
and and introduce some more, some honesty. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're our generations are living in a post factual era, so we have to rediscover uh, honesty, uh, authenticity, intellectual intellectual honesty, but but at the same time understanding that. Um, there are different truths out there. So yeah, I'm ready to discuss with you, Sarah. <laughs> Fantastic. So Johannes, let's just then pick up on um, point number, kind of one of those points that you mentioned. So what is mining? So what, what do we think mining is? And then perhaps let's look at it through a European lens. So what does what does mining mean in that Brussels or Geneva bubble versus perhaps what does it mean to the broader world? Yeah, indeed. So. I think what would be useful for everyone, um, certainly in Brussels, to think about is that mining uh, is not necessarily a single industry or a single activity. Um, and mining is very much a human response to uh, a demand for materials. So I'd like to think about it as there, there has always been, there there is today, and there probably will in future, be a whole spectrum of actors in uh, the activity of, um, of, of having raw materials from, from the earth. And that ranges from the, the top leading mining companies with all the, the biggest budgets, all the biggest brains in the world, <laughs> so doing things in, an, in you know, very well and um, all the way down to you know, quite frankly, uh, criminal actors. I mean, we have to acknowledge that in some parts of the world, uh, the mafia is involved in mining or you know, really organized crime. Um, I don't think it's useful anymore to talk about a future that where all of mining is only undertaken by these top leading companies that do everything in a perfect way. That's not how it will work. And probably if we want to um, make the biggest difference on the ground, we need to think more about uh, regulations, tools, ways of communicating, ways of promoting change with everyone in between. So all of those actors in the, it, that, in the mining uh, activity that are neither leading companies, neither criminals, but are uh, extracting raw materials out of the earth. Um, so, and, and in Europe, the same is, is true, um, it, perhaps with a, in, a, in a broader, uh, sorry, a more narrow spectrum where we uh, don't necessarily have the largest, uh, most dominating mining companies active in Europe anymore. Um, we probably do still have some criminal activity in some parts of Europe, if you, despite the, the, the tight regulations. Um, but we have a very, very uh, competent um, collection of uh, incumbent mining companies that have um, uh, remained, survived, com continue to compete with their international um, colleagues um, and, are, and are doing a very good job in, in terms of um, running very sustainable, productive mines. Um, so I... I would encourage more recognition of the diversity indeed in the sector. Um, and do you think, and do you think that, um, I mean, so within, within, let's just, just focus in on Brussels here, um, is, is mining in the conversation or is mining seen as being a negative activity? And I say this from the perspective of say COP26, some of those global conferences where mining doesn't have a seat at the table yet for, for various different reasons and because it perhaps comes across as being incredibly emotive very much tied up with coal for example is mining part of the discussion in Brussels or is it something that is seen as being quite emotive and so therefore we can't even get into the room let alone show the diversity of mining yeah it's it's a little bit of both sometimes um those of us who interact with the European institutions might feel that there's a bit of schizophrenia going on. Um, I, I think, the, stepping back, there are some, some broad realities uh, at play in Europe and, and some broad sweeps of, of, of history, if you like. So, um, first of all, um, mining activity has reduced in Europe. Uh, mining exploration has reduced in Europe. And this is the result of a, of a deliberate political choice. 
by the European countries in about the 1980s. We saw defunding of mining schools. We saw geological surveys no longer supporting exploration, moving to other activities, perhaps uh, more environmentally focused. Um, we saw some governments devolve responsibility for oversight of the mines to uh, more provincial or local level government who don't have the capacity now to, to receive you know, very complicated permit applications from, from major companies for, for complicated projects. So we need to recognize that you know, deliberate political choices were made in the 80s uh, and, and Europe is struggling to, to sort of reverse that trend and, and, and come back in, into the sector. Um, at the same time, in that period, we've seen the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain, and we've seen a, an accelerated drive to, to welcome um, uh, member states in, in the East and the Southeast that have um, been formerly under uh, Soviet uh, administrations, where the activity of mining was undertaken very, very differently. Um, those of us uh, with, you know, anchored in the, the Western capitalist world look at some of the operations that were undertaken uh, at that time in that part of the world and we would say well they probably should never have been mined the the all bodies the so-called all bodies that, that that the soviets were exploiting would not have got over the line in terms of what we consider uh, um, viable reserves in 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 a capitalist sense so Europe is struggling with digesting all of these um, you know uh, consequences and 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 um, visions of mining and, and, and in those parts of the world, it has unfortunately been associated with inefficiency, pollution, and due to the rush to um, enter the European Union and, and to, to sort of come back into the fold, um, mistakes have been made in terms of how those sites have been uh, looked after and cleaned up afterwards. So that affects the attitude in, in Europe. Um, and I've lost track of your question Sarah. <laughs> so well it's, it's about um, I guess is is mining how is mining discussed within Brussels but I think right. just maybe yeah do, do you want to address that? Uh, yes there's a double speak at, at play so um, unfortunately we are at a, at a juncture at the moment where the word mining um, is uh, not tolerated I would say at a certain political level. So in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of really good work um, coming out and, and a lot of good research, a lot of good reports explaining the need for raw materials for our green transition um, and, and a lot of buzz on, on social media. But if you look at the statements made, even by those politicians in Brussels that support this work, they manage to talk about it without mentioning the word mining. <laughs> so we talk about raw materials, we talk about responsible supply, we talk about supply risk, we talk about diversification, uh, domestic investment, but there's a lot of talk about uh, circular economy and recycling and, and a real reluctance to even use the, the term mining. So do we need to change the words or, you know, what do we need to do to, to fix this? Because this isn't, this isn't tenable in terms of us just ignoring you know, everybody who is doing what we know is mining, we need to be able to get that into the room. Is it as simple as just saying, right, we're going to call ourselves um, the, you know, resource supply or, or something like that. And we've had various discussions about that earlier in the week. Yeah, and, and I've had discussions like that with the industry in the past. You know, do you want to rebrand yourselves as the raw material supply industry? And I've got very strong pushback from the people within the industry. They're, they're proud to be miners. I don't know, I think this is wordsmithing and I think this is dodging the, 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 the real um, issue at hand. And that is what we've heard earlier today and, and from previous panels this week, which is um, we need to um, move from the talk to the walk. And um, we need to make more information um, available to different parties and, and have more trust building, more understanding. And I do, I, I, I feel quite strongly about the idea that each party, each um, community should come and explain their mental model, if you like. I think when in, in earlier this week, we talked about business models, mental models, and where the industry um, perhaps has failed uh, so far or, or recently is 
we don't explain enough our mental model or the reasons behind our mental model. And that leaves mis, um, uh, misunderstandings unaddressed. So I will very often hear statements made by politicians or stakeholder groups or, or European consumers about the, the motivations of mining companies, why big corporate companies do the things that they do. And um, very often, I think this is a misunderstanding. We, we need to go into those fora and explain, well, the reason that we fund exploration that way or the reason that we assess mining projects in that way the reason that we're driven to do things this way is because we are thinking about the, the resource, the reserve in a certain way. We're talking, we're thinking about return on investment. We're not necessarily um, trying to maximize profits, but we are trying to maximize the value of the deposit. And we are open to discussing, um, you know, to what extent uh, windfall profits at the, in the good times get redistributed to our host community. So we need to under, uh, explain um, the, if not the only truth or the reality, at least our mental model, the way we think about the way our system works. And I, I think maybe a, 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 an example to link to the previous talk, um, I would tend to agree. I, I, I think it's, it's um, it resonates with me, the idea that the leading companies are very, very good at putting out glossies to address you know, upwards, perhaps the, the some audiences with their reporting and not so good at um, addressing the, the local community. And I recognize that there probably is a fear of losing control. One aspect of that, one element of the, of the mental model of the people in the companies, I think, is that that sort of communication, that control of information is very, very strongly linked to legal risk. Lawyers get involved, security exchange commissions get involved, stakeholders get involved, and this is not helpful. I mean, so they, they have a role that they to protect um, people's uh, funds, basically, but it does get in the way with um, uh, what we would prefer in terms of engagement with stakeholders. In some countries like Germany, France, Belgium, there are rules around who you speak to and in, in, in which order. So you need to be able to, to, to show that you've consulted your workers before you've consulted anyone else. And so there are structures in our societies as well that, that we need to look at in terms of how do we optimize uh, engagement with communities. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Johannes. So just kind of spinning this round, perhaps into a final topic for us to discuss, uh, to discuss, and that's around all of the all of the minerals and metals and materials that we need for batteries, for example. So let's just focus in on the on the battery bit for the moment. And so, as you were mentioning, in the 1980s, Europe made the concerted decision to to sort of um, I guess, wind down on the mining side. Meanwhile, China was doing the total opposite and China was spinning up its minerals and materials strategy. So from a, from a battery materials perspective, of course, now we're thinking, help, where on earth do we get this from in a just manner? And what that means in Europe from a just perspective. Do you have any comments with, with okay, I say this comments, this could, this could last another three hours, actually, couldn't it? But any pointed comments, because that will then, um, I know that that Phil and Emma, for example, will be talking about some of these very specific minerals and materials with regards to going into those batteries, etc. Yeah, and, and here, I guess, I have a bit of ambivalence. So the, the, the term in trust transition, it's another one of those. Yeah. Uh, sort of generalized terms, but we might use that generalization to our advantage in this case, because um, I think you know, just is, is a very sort of value-based term. And therefore each stakeholder will have different ideas about what a just transition looks like, depending on their values and, and their value system. So it can be a very inclusive term, and we need to make sure that it's more inclusive than it is uh, diluting. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would suggest that in order for the transition to be just, we need to, to be um, having dialogue with the different stakeholders to understand what, you know, how inclusive could that term be? Just in terms of um, 
trying to avoid um, societal detriments, you know, the, the ways of doing things that, that, we, that we don't think fit our values at the same time, respecting the values of others, um, just in terms of um, who has access to the, to, the, uh, to the final products, but then who can also benefit from the production of those, of those final products. So just to be a little bit provocative, is it just to uh, deploy a global supply chain, um, have a lot of the processing come through a single country, and then to sort of swallow up and, 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 and keep to ourselves a kind of, uh, you know, by recycling all of those resources? Um, that's a question. Um, would it be more just to um, acknowledge and engage in not only trade of raw materials and products, but also trade of scrap and recyclates so that everyone can um, you know, contribute to or benefit from all the different steps of the value chain. Um, is, is a too restrictive supply chain just in the, in the long term in terms of uh, geopolitical concerns, uh, supply risk, um, uh, handing uh, uh, disproportionate power to particular countries who might uh, hold the the keys to, to certain supply chains. On the other hand, as I mentioned to you at the beginning of my talk, uh, so long as there's sufficient demand, there should always be openings for new entrants into the market. They might sometimes need government support. So we'd look at rare earths, for example, where it's clear 10 years ago, uh, most of the production was coming through China. Um, now, through pretty concerted support from some governments, I'm not sure that's um, totally well known, but particularly the Japanese government and the Australian government, the uh, proportion of rare, rare earths that are produced outside China is starting to increase. And this is not um, to be anti-China, but it might be there for a little bit more balanced, perhaps a little bit more just. Great, thank you very much for that, Johannes. As, as you know, we could carry on speaking all day with regards to this, but thank you so much for bringing into the room the European context, because Europe as, as a part of the world is incredibly complicated with a huge amount of history, not to say that other parts of the world don't have history as well, um, but I think it's something as well where when decisions are trying to be, be made within Brussels or Geneva, for example, actually, all of those member states are sitting around that table and perhaps um, not, we're not necessarily, I don't think it's it's very easy actually perhaps for, and I say this with, with a deep breath, those of us who are outside of Europe, mm -hmm. my sincere apologies with regards to that, um, it's quite difficult for us to actually comprehend the complexity with regards to some of that dialogue um, that is happening with, within the European Union. So awesome, thank you so, so much, Johannes. I know that you're gonna hopefully stay with us through the rest of the morning and we look forward to you contributing to the other talks as well. So brilliant, thank you very much, Johannes, brilliant. My, my pleasure. <laughs> Great. So um, you heard me mention some of those really important materials that are needed for all of this technology, which takes us straight into the fabulous Phil Bird. Um, in his introduction this morning, you heard him talk about this thing called uh, Met for Tech. Um, Phil, if you want to um, start sharing your slides and come to our virtual stage that we have in front of us, and I'll invite you to reintroduce yourself just in case people missed it at the beginning and then um, get going with what you want to add to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Over to Phil. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction, and, and thank you to Sarah and Rose for inviting me to talk here today. Uh, my name is Phil Bird. I'm a researcher at the University of Leicester. And I'm working on the Met for Tech project. Um, this is focused on technology metals, but is, is part of the UK's broader circular economy research program called NICER. Uh, and today, I would like to talk to you about technology metals and the challenges in quantifying the geological stocks of these resources. There we go. Uh, so our technological infrastructure now utilizes a greater diversity of metals than at any point in history, with over 40 metals being considered critical to maintaining our social and industrial structures. Uh, the diversification in metal use has occurred at the same time as a, a rapidly expanding global middle class and increased patterns of consumption that have driven the demand for metals ever higher. 
So many of these metals, such as tellurium, indium, scandium, some of them are highlighted in red, uh, possess unique properties that facilitate specialized uses in electronics, magnets, advanced alloys, etc. And in individual applications, only require very small quantities. For example, uh, the touchscreen of a smartphone has a 0.01 grams of indium in it uh, on the surface coating. But these specialized properties also limit potential substitution. And many of these elements are extracted from the earth as byproducts of other mining activities. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, in general, the current mining paradigm is focused on a, a high value or high volume main product, uh, such as copper, aluminium, or iron. You're being extracted from the ground, beneficiated, and shipped for refining. Uh, this block of ore, though, will contain other elements in addition to the main product. And some of these are of interest to the mining companies. For example, copper ores, commonly also your gold and silver, and these are called co-products. But the remaining elements, which include many of these technology metals, are generally not of interest to the mining companies. In fact, they might actually be penalized if they're always too rich in these elements when it's shipped to the refiner. Um, the refiner, though, is able to recover these elements in the process and sell them at a profit. For example, tellurium is recovered from copper ores as a necessary step in purifying gold concentrates. Uh, and many, many of the elements that are now essential parts of our technology are recovered mainly as byproducts. Uh, this diagram shows companionality of elements, that is, how much of their supply is from the mining of another metal. And the ores, the, uh, the elements within the red circle, uh, these ones are of particular concern because greater than 50% of their supply is dependent on another commodity. So, for example, selenium and tellurium in the bottom half of the diagram are entirely dependent on copper for their production. The dependence on another commodity can potentially cause challenges to the supply of these metals with increasing demand not necessarily translating to an increased supply if the demand for the main product is not increasing. And this is a problem because the demand for many of these metals, tellurium, selenium, cadmium, etc., is, is only expected to grow. And that's because many of these high companionality byproduct elements are essential for, te for technologies integral to the green transition. And we need a lot of these metals. The UK strategy for net zero and electrification of the internal combustion fleet will require an estimated 10 years of current neodymium and dysprosium production, two years of annual cobalt production. And that might be achievable if it was just in the UK, but every industrialized nation is doing the same thing. So we need decades worth of global supplies of these metals and we need them as soon as possible. And one suggestion people brought up recently is recycling. It's a hot topic and there have been many calls recently for us to stop mining the earth and to instead mine e-waste. But we need many times more of these materials than has ever been mined. And unfortunately for many of the elements, the current applications are in a form that is simply not amenable to recycling. So for now we need to carry on mining. But there is a fundamental lack of knowledge regarding the stocks and flows of byproduct elements. The diagram here shows a model estimating the cumulative flow of tellurium from copper mining and refining over the course of the 20th century. Uh, the majority of tellurium has been lost, with only 4% of the estimated potential resource making it to the market. Uh, the important point, however, is actually that this is an estimate. And in truth, there are no good models for either primary tellurium resources uh, and also the data on the efficiency of recovery is highly contradictory. And what is the problem with this? Well, it has some really serious impacts. It limits attempts to improve recovery efficiency in active deposits. It limits our ability to conduct long-term economic planning. Uh, it limits the flexibility of supply. We do not know where a lot of these elements are, and we're currently relying on only a few small sources. Um, and unfortunately, it results in countries with these resources unknowingly exporting their critical elements, which they may need for their own green projects. And they get almost no remuneration for this. And often, in fact, they will have to pay a penalty on these elements. Uh, regrettably, the net flow of material is also from less developed to more developed countries. So, for example, Belgium is one of the leading uh, suppliers of tellurium and selenium in the world, despite having no native copper deposits of its own. So why don't companies produce models for these byproduct elements? Well, if you examine technical reports for uh, active or 
mine, active mines or deposits that are being currently explored, you'll find that the collection of multi-element data, including many critical elements, is conducted as standard. So on the diagram here is a, for the pebble deposit, which is a, a multi-million uh, tonne copper deposit in Alaska. And it's the history of its ex exploration for its technical reports. Uh, and you'll be able to see that from the earliest days of the projects, they were conducting geochemistry that included uh, technology elements such as tellurium, selenium, rhenium, um, but they were not publishing estimates for the resource. It was always focused on gold, copper, and molybdenum. And the pebble deposit is, is interesting because following the publication of the, the US's 2018 critical minerals list, which included rhenium for the first time, they actually produced in their next technical report an estimate for a rhenium resource. And they did this by using archived geochemical data and limited geochemical modeling. And they were able to present a rhenium resource of 2,615 tons, which is enough for 44 years of annual rhenium supply. Um, so if the necessary data is there and it's widely available, why don't we see more critical element resources from these, these large copper deposits or other similar deposits? Well, reporting of resources and resources, uh, reserves and resources is governed by a number of national and supranational codes who have strict definitions for what can and cannot be classed and reported as a resource. And while there are multiple restrictions, such as concepts around materiality and public interest, fundamentally, it comes down to one of value. All the codes, and here is some of the, the language they use, require that a resource has reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. And unfortunately, in the case of the byproducts, that just isn't the case from the perspective of the mining company. Here, the distribution of value in all material from selected porphyry copper deposits is displayed. And you can see that gold and copper, with less frequently molybdenum, dominate the value of metals contained within the ore. And in fact, all of the byproduct elements combined account for less than 1% of the total value of metals in the ore. A common refrain is that as demand increases, the price will go up and people will explore for and mine these metals. But when you consider that gold and tellurium, for example, occur at similar concentrations in these deposits, the price of tellurium would need to increase to something similar to levels of gold for it to be of real interest to a mining company. And at that price, all but the richest nations and customers will be excluded from any technology that would be related to it. So if they are such low value, how are they ever recovered? Well, as I said earlier, the refiner doesn't have to pay for the cost of extracting and processing the ore. And in fact, it charges mining companies a penalty for having to purify their gold. Uh, and some people might be thinking, well, some mines have their own refining facilities, and yes, they do. And they produce some byproduct elements, but it is only ever as part of purifying the main prey product. Much of the critical element resource is likely lost much earlier in the process, you know, to tailings or to waste. Um, because when they are mining a deposit, they will follow the copper grade rather than mining a block that contains significant byproduct element, but no copper. So what do we do to address this problem? Well, there have been suggestions that we need to update the reporting codes to allow the reporting of selected critical resources, even if they are not economic from the perspective of a reporting company, but they do align with the national interest of the host nation. Even if this was achieved, and that would be a big task, it may require incentivization to get companies to report these elements, the construction of resource estimates being expensive and time consuming. But it is something we desperately need to do because without a better knowledge of the resource base, we are going to struggle to not only find these materials, but guarantee a long term supply for them. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, I'm happy to discuss anything anyone would like to about this. Um, please look for Metfotech in the future. Uh, some really interesting research across multiple disciplines is taking place regarding technology metals. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for that, Phil. Absolutely brilliant. Round of applause. Awesome. Um, um, Rose, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I know I haven't given you a heads up. Do you have anything that you want to, to ask to, to Phil? Because I know that you recognise some of the diagrams, for example, that he was showing in his presentation. Yeah, thanks for that, Phil. That was a, a really good it's really interesting seeing my diagram used. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and the topic um, being explored a little bit more. Um, do you think that this is something that the, the mineral resource and reserve codes need to look at, like Crisco or those bodies? Or is this something that needs to be done from a, from a national level or from a company level? So when I've looked at this, it's, it's interesting because they're, they're, they're global targets, right? And the idea of critical minerals from governments. And then we expect companies to, to act on this. Um, so who do you think this needs to really come down to? I think it's going to take a, a collaboration of multiple organisations, both private and uh, public uh, and national, to, to achieve, you know, fundamentally the, the codes that are put in place are there for very good reasons to prevent corruption, but by nature they have to be very generalised and they're not really focused on, on the demand for, for these critical metals. Um, governments certainly can have a role and... Publishing critical metal lists does seem to be encouraging some companies to focus on these elements more, but you could legislate it, but it would possibly be seen as more you know, interference, more guidelines to things that are already not overly popular. Um, so certainly all of those organizations you mentioned definitely have a role, but there's also going to need to be a role of the public in it because it comes down a lot of the time to what are investors interested in and investors start expressing that we care about these technology metals. We want to know, you know, what are you doing to help contribute to the supply of them? Then companies will respond um, because they have a duty to by the regulations and they will start reporting on these things. Thanks, you. Thank you very much for that, Phil. Thanks, Rose, for putting you on the spot there with that. Um, so, Phil, with this, I mean, in terms of the, the reporting of the, the, the byproducts that are there, I mean, so most exploration companies, when they send those samples off for assay or for that chemical characterization, they have they have a lot of this information. Um, it's just that we we don't necessarily feel the need to report on that. So um, do you think I mean, so even if the, the codes won't update, is there a different way of getting at that information so that, for example, even just like the characterization of waste, for example, um, let alone what byproducts might be in there that we can use for the future. Is there something that can be done there? Uh, it's very challenging to get hold of this information. Um, the flow of information from mining companies into the public domain is very controlled. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a duty to archive their geochemical data for seven years for active deposits, but the reporting side of it is primarily through these technical reports and the regulations on technical reports are sufficiently vague that a very minimal amount of detail is actually included. Um, it's because they need to be interpretable by the layman who has no real knowledge of mining or geochemical processes or any of this. So there is a deliberate effort to try and keep scientific uh, data out of it to make it more broadly understandable. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> It also feels as well, I mean, only having to archive this data that actually people have paid huge sums of money for, really, when you think about the whole project of going and collecting the rock in the first place, and then the actual chemical analysis, seven years is nothing, especially when it go, you know, takes, what, 30 years to get from saying, yep, I've now got some, I know that there's some copper down there now, now let's go build the mine. I mean, seven years just feels like a astoundingly short time horizon to say to someone you have to archive this information. Yeah, it does seem like a short uh, time span when you consider the average discovery to production for a mine is 15 years and then the average mine life is 25 to 30 years. Um, it is mainly as part of accounting. So if they need to go and review the data because someone has questions about something they have presented or there's a, a takeover bid that they can go and show the data. Um, while the seven years is what they are mandated to do, they do hold on to this information for much longer it forming part of their broader geological exploration programs. And it's, as a result, considered proprietary data for them. Uh, their discovery is potentially leading to new discoveries in the same or different uh, terrains. And so final question on this, Phil, and sorry for digging into this data That's bit. Right. Um, is there, is there and, and also earlier on in the week, we did, we did a, approach the area of colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a requirement to provide governments um, you know, for those countries, for example, where exploration is taking place with these data sets? Like, do they get that granularity of data or is that not a requirement at the moment? 
no, they don't. There are, uh, depending on the country you're in, it depends on how much they need to communicate. Uh, com most commonly, environmental reports are the, the key thing that gets submitted to governments, along with mining plannings for permitting, etc. But the actual um, geochemical data is not included in that beyond the resource models that are already presented by the, the technical reports. Um, and it is interesting you talk about the concept of colonialism regarding these sorts of things, because as I said, there is a flow of this material from less developed to more developed countries. Um, but what I've talked about here is only a small part of it. And there are also issues regarding uh, the technology for smelting and where that is located. Um, and there does seem to be a real dichotomy between more developed countries having more advanced smelting technology and producing these technology elements and less developed places having a, a lot more restricted access to this advanced technology. Um, so yeah, we're export, we're importing it and they're exporting it, but it's not really an equitable distribution, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Phil. It's an um, absolutely brilliant addition to, to the conversation as a whole. Round of applause to Phil Bird, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you Thank very, you very, very much. much. Fantastic. Great. So it now gives me great pleasure to welcome to our virtual stage the fantastic Zach Wood. Um, Zach, if you want to hit the various buttons your end that are needed to bring up that slide presentation. Um, and, um, and Zach, as you can see here, well, I'll let Zach, I'll let you introduce yourself, sir. So everybody, please round of applause for the fabulous Zach Wood. Thanks, Sarah. I uh, am uh, sorry about the, hopefully that doesn't come through the background noise. <laughs> um, guys, thank you very much. I, I, after some quite technical and really great presentations, I, I'm taking a step back and a slightly more philosophical and high level discussion because I want to talk about the social compact that underlies or uh, is so closely involved in this concept of a just transition. You know, we, we talk about the just transition and we've been talking about it on quite a technical level but there's a broader and more fundamental change needed here and some broader work. And so I've been quite deliberate about the agenda for a future period. Uh, you know, this is not, this is not, we mustn't confuse ourselves. We're not talking about specifically for mining or what is one country going to look like? This is what does the world look like as we move forward? I want to introduce you to my son. I want to start off with that. Um, so if I ramble today or anything sounds a little incoherent, it's because I haven't slept in 16 weeks. Uh, but also if I flirt with sometimes sounding a little bit overly emotive, um, it's because there's a good reason to be. And I think for all of us, it's useful to remind ourselves that these little, uh, these little things are a lot, a lot of the reason why we're doing this. Okay, is what does that next generation look like? We're only stewards of our time. Uh, and we will pass. And what does the next card look like? Just so everybody's clear, that's a child, not actually a penguin. It's a child in a penguin suit. Um, anyway, that's my boy, Colin. But I'm conscious he's been born at this terrible time. He's going to live through turmoil like humanity you may never have seen before. Uh, you know, as climate change really comes to bear. Um, we've got this continued political instability. We're going to see more and more breakouts of war closer to home. Uh, we're going to see the knock-on effects of how those wars, I mean, we're seeing how the, the war in the Ukraine is affecting the world, but that's going to grow and we're going to see how that impacts supply chains, how it impacts our, our uh, access to services that are necessary for survival. You know, at the very best, we're going to watch the global economy kind of shift into some new paradigms that we don't really understand yet and we don't know what that's going to look like. And I hope it's a shift. I hope it's a transition because the alternative is significant. Uh, and we'll come back to that now. Um, but saying that, I'm also conscious that Colin's very fortunate because he's been born into uh, relative prosperity. He's been born into a family with the, the means to make sure he has access to good health care. He has access to uh, um, a good education. Uh, we have discretionary time, so we can make sure that we spend time with him. I don't have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to walk 10 kilometers to catch a taxi for two hours so that I can get to a job that's going to pay me, you know, 300 rand a day. Um, he, he has a full-time nanny that takes care of him while my wife and I are working. And, uh, 
you know, and while we're working, we get to do it at home. So he has all of these benefits and privileges and, and, and enormously fortunate things. And I think for most of us, many of us on the call, that's the kind of life that we experience. Uh, you know, we're in a similar situation. Anyway, I, I tell you about Colin for two reasons. One is um, I want to personalize some of the discussions that we're having. Uh, we can often talk about these things in quite an academic way, uh, but there are real, real impacts here and there are impacts on us and it's important that we bring that home. Uh, this is not just something that is part of our job. And, and secondly, you know, we have this urgent and pressing need for a new social compact that's going to support, it's going to enable, and it's going to drive the just transition. And so I want to ask, we'll start with the question, I want to open with a question here. Uh, you can just chew on it while we talk, while I, while I go over and, and chew on it over the weekend and think about it next time that you're sitting in a meeting planning a, a mine expansion or a community relocation or... Um, uh, you know, a share scheme payout, uh, when you're planning how you're going to work with the clients on anything, on any of their engagements, just think about this question. You know, what society would I like to have been born into? We can't all be born into the into the world that, uh, that Colin's been born into. Many of us are born into a place with uh, enormous loss and lack of privileges, of access, uh, you know, it's not just wealth. We talk about whether you could be born with good or bad health from a rich or a poor family, ill or well-educated, uh, atheistic or religious, grew up in a big city or in the countryside. You know, would you want to be born into a world where you have very few rights or where you have uh, complete rights? You know, there are many different questions about this. And some of this comes back to uh, a, um, a dialogue I had some years ago. I was on a uh, I was at this conference, and to start, the warmer was we sat down in pairs. It was a conference to talk about race and racism. And uh, we sat down in pairs, and we had to tell each other why we were there. I'm very woke. I'm very connected. I know, you know, I'm very sensitive. I'm very socially conscious. And I said to the woman that I sat opposite, I said to her, I'm very aware of my privileged position and I want to know how I can change things. I'm very aware that there's this imbalance and this unfairness in the world and I want to know what I can do to fix that. And she said to me, and I'm going to tone down the language a little bit, but she said to me, don't you dare. She said, it's got nothing to do with you. It's not your job. You come from the top of the totem pole. You sit, and all of us on this call, sit somewhere close to the top of the totem pole, you know, maybe not all right at the top, but we're, we're all pretty close. Whatever changes we try to make in the world will always be about us. It will always come from us. It will always come from our position of power. So the best thing that we can do is be open to that change happening rather than not open. In fact, I, 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 I've just finished reading the most amazing book, which I can recommend to everybody, just about how as power shifts, as economic power shifts in the world, what does that look like? And how does that lead to unrest and, uh, and changes? And so this, this comes to this thing of, you know, with great privilege comes this great responsibility, but also great risk. The transition to a low carbon future is a technical one and it's going to happen. Okay. Or it's going to fail. And if it fails, then we're all in trouble. All right. Um, but if it happens and we manage this transition and we get to this low carbon future, unless we fundamentally rethink and rebaseline our socioeconomic compact, well, then it's going to, you know, things are going to kick off. We have to rebuild the socioeconomic structure in a way that is less based on wealth accumulation and more based on security and quality and meaning of life, you know, for a broad base. Uh, and we, those of us on this call, those people attending this presentation, we don't necessarily get to be the ones who decide what that looks like. We need to engage and really reach out and try and understand our job, our role is to listen. It's to listen really hard. And I thought Sarah's question earlier of have we asked communities what it is they want to see is a great example of that. That's an example of listening. 
of us going out and saying, well, what do you need? What, what is it that you need? You lead us, you guide us. People who are at the bottom of the totem pole, people who are going to, they're going to feel the effects of climate change much harder than we will. They're going to feel the pain of these economic changes much harder than we will. We, we will survive. We will find our way through. But if we don't re-baseline the socioeconomic structure, we're going to end up with some, some uh, you know, the, then, then we run big risks. And if anybody doesn't recognize that picture, it's of the French Revolution. Hopefully everybody does, but just for... Um, anyway, but look, that's enough, enough naval gazing from me. Let's, uh, let's get into what this means for mining um, and how we can get into, into some discussions on mining. In order for us to accomplish any of these changes and shifts around the social compact, we need to build that accomplishment on the basis of relationship. As we expand the relationship, so we expand the opportunities for accomplishment uh, and they expand proportionately. But we've got to work on that. We have to start at that basis. We can share, we can spread, but we have to start at that basis of, of relationship. If we think about mining and some examples recently, I mean, this, this all happened in the last couple of weeks. Look, the pictures on the left are of striking miners. You may or may not recognize the bottom one. It was a very famous picture from the Marikana strikes, the strikes that led to the Marikana massacre. But uh, these strikes are ongoing. So Banya is currently under strike. Um, uh, you know, and it's the same industry, but in two different worlds. And this is not to not to have a go at Sabanya and, and the big payouts that have just happened. Not at all. You know, I think a lot of mining executives and a lot of mining companies have gotten these big payouts. And, and I, I, I don't make any judgment or value call around that. Um, but I think what is important is that we're talking in one industry, but these are fundamentally separate worlds that people are living in. Uh, and the the breakdown in trust that happens this thin red line is not that thin it's a significant one and suddenly we begin we 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 collapse the ability to talk across those two worlds uh you know savannah when you know the full story is doing incredible work i mean they really are one of the leading companies in south africa in terms of positive social impact but how do we position that how do we share that so there's a breakdown in trust between labor and mining. There's a further breakdown in trust between government and everybody, you know, and of course I use the South African example, but the British will know all about the breakdown in trust with government. I mean, worldwide, you know, the Americans are seeing the same thing. So how do we begin to rebuild that trust? And unless we do, we can never have this accomplishment relationship uh, basis. Fernando Flores and Robert Solomon have written this great book around building trust in business, in politics, in life. And their thesis is, yeah, trusting is something we do. It's something we have to do on an ongoing basis. We build, we maintain, we sustain it. It's easily broken, very difficult to build, easily broken, but we have to build it. If we don't build it in mining, we will not be allowed to continue mining in whatever form that looks like, whatever mining looks like, uh, uh, to Johannes's point earlier, you know, whether it's extraction or whether it's recycling, or whether it's anything, we have to start from that basis of trust. We have to begin creating that. <coughs> and there's a pretty straightforward formula for, for trust because everybody, many of the people on this call, I guess, will be engineers and geologists and, and smart people who like formulas. So uh, I thought, well, coming from the softer side, let's have a look at one of those. We've got to think about credibility. Is can I trust what you say is objectively true? How sincere are you? Can I trust that you mean what you say? And then how reliable are you? Can I trust that you will do what you say? Finally, we have this kind of common interest, this alignment question. And, and this is a good formula because when we can align on where we're going, uh, that has a massive impact. I mean, it's the denominator. That has a big impact on whether or not we can build that trust. But if we break any of those top three, we're going to miss it. So specifically speaking, I want to specifically speak now to uh, credibility and reliability. And from a mining company's perspective, I think, you know, when we start to engage, when we start to discuss, when we start to share, there's been some talk 
about reporting. Uh, Phil brought up this question around, well, what gets shared, what doesn't get shared? Mining companies need to start to open their kimonos, as it were. And some of them have, some of them are doing amazing work around this, but we're thinking in terms of whole value. We're thinking in terms of uh, ceilings and foundations. I'm sure everyone here knows of, um, uh, knows of donut economics. Um, sorry, I'm not trying to find the book here, but it's, it's lying here somewhere. Uh, everyone, know, everyone knows of uh, Kate's donut economics concept. That is one of the most fundamentally uh, uh, mind-shifting uh, economic structures that we can think of. And we've got to be thinking in those terms. We have to think about whole value. We have to think about the fact that we can no longer consider companies to be doing well or poorly based on their financial performance. We have to look at their full performance, their total performance across all dimensions. And if we can do that, then we can begin to travel along this roadmap. A roadmap is not a series. We always like to draw roadmaps. Everybody does. They draw it as a straight line. And they go, well, we're going to go from here to there to there to there to there, and then we're there. But that's not going to happen. The world is way too complicated for that. What we need is this kind of broad map. And then some goals, some objectives, some things that we want to hit, all right, broadly. And a good example is the Sustainable Development Goals, which are a fantastic broad objective that everybody can start to work towards. And we may or may not hit them, but it gives us a guiding star, a guiding principle. We can all travel there by different routes. And so I think that comes down to my final point. And I, I, yeah, I don't want to overrun here, but my final point about this, uh, this just transition. The just transition is going to need a new social compact. The moving towards that is going to be a series of ongoing they're going to continue. It's not a, this is not a one-stop thing. We don't stamp it and say, okay, we've, we've succeeded. It's going to be often clumsy. We are going to make mistakes. Communities are going to make mistakes. Governments, God knows, are going to make mistakes. All right. It's going to be a series of negotiations. All right. But we need to move towards a more formally inclusive socioeconomic model. And I don't talk just economic because maybe as we move forward, maybe there aren't jobs for everybody. You know, maybe in the new, uh, maybe in a low cost, low carbon energy uh, rich future, maybe not everybody needs to have a job and that's okay. Maybe we move into a totally different structure. So we need to be thinking in terms of the socioeconomic model that is formally inclusive, that includes everybody. We can't allow ourselves in 10, 15, 20, 30 years to have, you know, 25, 30% of the world wondering where they're going to get their next meal uh, and not able to take care of their children. So this is going to require transparency and whole value visibility. That again, that whole value that I was talking about. And it will require that trust to be gifted and then to be honored through visibility, through tracking, through sharing all of these points. Sarah, that's my what I'd like to leave everybody with. And I hope, I know it's gonna make small incremental changes, but I hope it latches on for people somewhere. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Zach. As as always, truly brilliant. Um, everyone, please put your hands together for the fabulous Zach Wood. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Zach. Um, and thank you also to your dogs in the background. Um, we've had much pet participation over the course so of the last... So sorry about them. They, they've <laughs> got no respect. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. I mean, Zach, there are so there are so many aspects that I could um, I could lean into with regards to your presentation just now. And I think that... Um, I think that the one just from your second last slide where it's like, we know where we've got to get to, we know what that guiding star is, and it's totally okay for us all to take slightly different routes to be able to get there. And I think that that respect for the fact that everyone probably will take a slightly different route is, uh, is something that's so, it's so important. Um, so brilliant. Thank you so much. And I and I think as well, I know that everyone is, is sitting here. Again, I've got lots of messages coming in behind the scenes. General appreciation and love for you, I think, Zach, and your new little person um, and, and what he has also brought to the party. So brilliant, Zach. Thank you so, so much. Massive round of applause. Um, and yeah, thank you very much again. Brilliant. Cool. Thanks, so, so this then takes us um, into, into our next presentation, who's the fantastic Emma Schofield. Um, 
Emma, I think we're going to be sharing your slides from our end here. If uh, if you would like to, you've got your microphone on, it's all fabulous. I'm just going to relinquish the stage and let you introduce yourself to the masses um, and then we will share your slides for you. So everybody, please put your hands together for the fantastic Dr. Emma Schofield from Johnson Matthey. Thank you very much. Well, I have to start by thanking you, Sarah, for inviting me to talk about platinum group metals, which are very much part of the discussion on the just transition and, of course, a topic very close to my heart. So uh, next slide, please, Rose. I introduced myself earlier as the Platinum Group Metal Research Fellow working for Johnson Matthey. I'm hoping you've heard of us. Um, we're not a miner, but we are the largest secondary refiner globally for platinum group metals. So we make products containing things that appear on critical uh, metals lists all over the world, which means, of course, that responsible sourcing and recycling our products sustainably are at the top of our priorities list. Next slide. So my focus is the platinum group metals, which are platinum, palladium, rhodium, iridium and ruthenium. And they're going to be represented by their chemical symbols because I don't generally have enough space to write them out in full. So I hope you're listening to that list. But one reason they score so highly in the criticality assessments is their economic importance. They're expensive, particularly compared to things like cobalt um, for the base metals or battery metals, as they now get called, and um, neodymium or dysprosium for magnets. And they have applications across a range of essential technologies, catalytic converters, process catalysts for making um, things like ammonia for fertilizer, printed circuits in electronics, and fuel cells which create power without releasing harmful emissions or particulates. Um, the amounts that go into autocatalyst and um, for automatic uh, for platinum and palladium are actually off the scale. And um, if you just put them on the scale, then you wouldn't be able to see any of the other applications, which is why those are kind of shooting off the graph. Next slide, please. So the other aspect of criticality of PGMs is the supply risk. And these graphs show supply um, in terms of supply is defined as primary material, which is material that has been mined. And this gives you the distribution over the major geographical locations where we get these from. And you'll see that Russia supplies a lot of the world's palladium. And the events of the past year have highlighted that political, uh, that particular geopolitical risk. An important point to make about the criticality of PGMs is their codependency, and Phil illustrated this beautifully a couple of talks ago. A proportion of PGMs are mined as a byproduct, or from our perspective, we like to think of it as a co product of nickel and copper mining. Even if you mine for platinum specifically, you get the other PGMs at the same time, and also gold, as co products. And we talk about them in terms of baskets where the basket price is the value of the collection of PGMs and gold that have been extracted together. And while there are some North American mines where palladium is the primary product, all the other palladium and 100% of the rhodium, ruthenium and iridium mined globally is mined as a co-product. Next slide, please. This slide compares the amount of PGM, platinum group metal, which was available from primary refining and what's recycled. As you can see, the amount of PGM recycled each year is about a third of demand. I mean, this is, this is absolutely critical. Some manufacturers will be able to use recycled metal in their products, and it has a good impact on life cycle assessments. It gives them um, an appearance of corporate responsibility, and that's of course to be encouraged. But the rest of the people who also need the, the PGM in the um, mind, um, dug out of the ground sources, will not be able to get recycled material. So looking at it from the perspective of the global um, customer source, we have to think about what, where all of the metal is going and not just uh, focus on the recycled part of it. Um, I should mention a note of caution about these data. This is not the entirety of the platinum group metal. So the numbers under recycled are only the open loop part of the picture and not the closed loop part of the cycle. So um, in the next slide, in, ah, have I skipped one? Right, let's go to open and closed loop recycling. Um, 
for closed loop, we sell, for example, a catalyst to the customer and they own this huge amount of metal. And at the end of its life, the catalyst is returned to us, but still um, the metal is still owned by the customer. We refine it and an equivalent amount of metal is returned either as fresh catalyst or it's credited to the customer in a metal account. But because the net supply of metal in use hasn't changed, it isn't recorded in the recycling figures. It doesn't count as market supply. The owner's sitting on a significant investment of metal and therefore keeps very good track of where it is and what we're doing with it when they send it to us. In open loop recycling, however, the bottom part of the slide, the metal sold into the market and wanders off with no one keeping track of where it's gone. So um, iridium spark plugs are not economic to recycle, so nobody bothers to collect them. And all of that iridium in very, very tiny quantities dissipates into waste. In fact, recycling of open loop metal is only really done for auto catalyst jewelry and electronics, which is mostly platinum, palladium and rhodium. And there's almost no, very little open loop recycling for ruthenium and iridium, despite their importance um, in a number of uh, technology applications. Next slide. ESG is at the heart of the just transition. And for PGMs, it's about responsible sourcing, trading, processing and movement of metal within our own operations, but also those of our suppliers, customers and partners. So this is a condensation, all the points will be familiar, um, of the key points of JM's supplier conduct code. I have to say that the full document is considerably longer than what I've put up on here. Next slide. So to consolidate standards of due diligence in the industry, the LPPM, the London Platinum and Palladium Market, have set out responsible platinum and palladium guidance, RPPG, if anyone's into acronyms, for refiners and for sponge accreditation. Now, I put a picture of some platinum sponge in here for anyone who doesn't know that it's a pure metallic powder that only looks spongy at a magnification of greater than 20 microns. Anyway, to be accredited as a good delivery refiner and or a member of the sponge accreditation lists, refiners generate their own compliance reports, which get audited through independent third parties on an annual schedule and the details of what level of detail um, is in the slides. This accreditation system is very thorough, it's very intensive, and I'm going to open possibly um, the can of worms, which you may have touched on earlier in the week, um, to think about whether distributed ledger technology, this ongoing discussion, is a way to approach. Now there are two areas here, there's what goes on within the refinery, and there's what goes on as the material moves from one place to another along a supply chain. Next slide, please. So each batch is going to come into a refinery with its own extended wrap sheet, detailing its life prior to refining. Once it gets through the, well, once it gets to evaluation, but once it gets through the doors of the refinery, it's going to be blended, split, processed, reprocessed until the backstory of metal in each batch is, yes, finite, but increasing exponentially each time it goes through a step of the hundreds of steps of the refining process. The metal's then going to leave the refinery, go through the product life cycle and come back again, trailing this massive list of data which it will continue to carry. So I can imagine a distributed ledger technology working where batches of stuff are moving from one place to another, moving through multiple hands coming from sources which it's useful to track, but once the material reaches the entrance of the refinery, well, this is a, an area where I have questions rather than answers, and uh, it would be interesting to get the input from the people um, in this discussion for anyone who has insight on how on earth to handle that. Next slide, please. So um, that's everything that I wanted to say. So um, Sarah, back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Emma. Um, massive round of applause. Thank you so, so much. Um, I think our brains are now filled with um, platinum group elements, sponges. We're all still working out why. Hang on a second. A sponge is something I have in the bath and we're talking about platinum. Um, <laughs> so, so with regards to this, I mean, you, you alluded to the fabulous world of blockchain. 
I suspect. Do you, do you want to expand on that? Just tiptoeing straight into the area. <laughs> well, I'm trying to work out how it's going to work. Um, I mean, we have a fully blown accreditation system for what goes on inside the refinery. And then we have um, the very much the um, supply chain due diligence. Um, you know, we follow up on our customers. I mean, they're customers rather than um, suppliers. So we have supply chain, customer due diligence. Um, I'm seeing the world moving towards distributed ledger technology. And I've been told not to say blockchain by various people who run other <laughs> forms of software than blockchain, but which does the same kind of thing and is alleged to have fewer of the um, disadvantages that, of course, is part of the, the global discussion as well. But, I mean, you can't label an, at an atom and it's not one product like a, like a chemical product, which, you know, that's waste, that's the product it goes through here. It's, mm. I, again, uh, I very much welcome suggestions as to how that could possibly work within such a complex set of processes as go on within a, um, a metal refinery. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, it's something where using um, distributed ledger technology, which doesn't roll off the tongue nearly as easily as something like no. blockchain. So we need to find, if blockchain is the wrong word, for example, because of course it refers to something very specific, we need to find an easier <laughs> set of language to be able to use. Um, but I guess it's something where, you know, what, what are the important aspects that need to be recorded as those atoms effectively pass through the process? Because I suspect, you know, everybody in the world of copper, for example, are looking at um, similar problems because how can you fingerprint that, that exact atom of, of copper? And we don't want to fingerprint the exact atom because that would be a, a very weird rabbit hole to go down. But at the end of the day, we're trying to assure ourselves that you know, human rights have been adhered to, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through each of those steps. Is that correct? Yes. So um, the need for a distributed ledger technology within a refinery is to precisely make sure that the um, ESG parameters that are so important to us are visibly and transparently adhered to. And so it doesn't really matter what the methodology is. You know, yeah. the distributed ledger might be a simpler way to do it a more transparent way to do it for um, extended processes, for extended supply chains, to me, and again, this is, I'll, I'll admit my position of ignorance here, it doesn't sound like the best way to get that, um, that goal um, within a refining context. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I guess I'm concerned that it's one of those things that will go into fashion and you know, everybody must have a distributed leisure as part of their supply chain, yes, and not make the distinction between what's actually happening within, within the processing unit, which can be monitored in other sorts of ways. Mm, no, exactly. And I guess that comes back to some of what we were speaking about um, yesterday and the day before, actually, in terms of what kinds of information do we need at what point in time in order to be able to say, well, actually, what's happening? Um, and again, the, whoever's using that information probably needs it for different purposes. Mm. So it's like the sort of single source of that information, which can then be used in multiple different ways. But we actually know what the original, the raw data set was. Um, Phil, I'm not sure if, if you're still on the line at the moment, but I mean, something that I find um, truly exciting, really, with regards to the, the, the platinum group metals is, you know, in the concept of using byproducts, I mean, hey, look at what goes on with the PGMs and everything, because actually that's something where we're not just pulling the platinum out. There are all the rest of the bits and pieces that are lovely in there as well. Um, Phil, is there anything that the rest of us can actually learn from the world of the, the platinum group metals, et cetera, that you know, we can then say, well, hang on, this is, this is a case where there is a market for some of the, the other materials that are produced during that incredibly complicated refining process. I mean, the thing with, with regards to platinum, it's not just one building that this stuff goes into, it's a whole series of increasingly complicated chemistry sets, um, which, is, which is really exciting when you get to go anywhere near them. But Phil, do you wanna comment on any of that? Um, the, the platinum system is, is fascinating, um, in part because of the, the economic dynamics of the byproduct systems there, because as Emma was saying, uh, palladium, with its remarkable rise in, rise in price recently, has actually overtaken and become kind of the main product almost in a lot of deposits. Um, the challenge with using them as a, a comparison and learning from them is that they have a lot higher value than other potential byproducts. You know, if you're talking 
oh, we have some palladium or platinum in our deposit, is it worth us recovering versus if we have some tellurium, the value you can potentially get is much higher from those platinum root minerals than, than what you will get from most other byproducts. So it's difficult to, to compare because they have that, that base value that can cover the, the expense of recovering them. And maybe Emma, just to come back to to you on this, and um, apologies if this is this is a horrible question, but um, with regards to, <laughs> with regards to the world of of say the platinum group um, materials, so having worked for, for an organisation that um, that extracts and, and refines an, an awful lot of them, there was always the discussion around the market and how to actually create the markets for them. So things like yes. Uh, you know, traditionally, of course, lots being used in catalytic converters, but then what about hydrogen fuel cells um, and the use of different materials with regards to that? Um, how much do you think has actually been, so we know that we've got these materials, so can we create the market for them? So you've got that kind of push into a market space versus, well, no, hang on a second, we're designing hydrogen fuel cells or whatever. Can we use substitution elements and materials with regards to that? Because there's always that balancing act in terms of the cost of a material versus how do we actually design something? And of course, at the end of the day, it's not like we can just go outside and scrape some dirt off the ground and say, hey, we're going to make a battery out of this. It's far, far, far more complicated than that. I don't know if you've got any comments with regards to that. So one of the constant themes in um, platinum metal product, platinum root metal product research is can we substitute the metals out of it? <laughs> so, I mean, people would like to think that, you know, if you've got palladium in there, you could put nickel in instead. Um, yeah. Like hitch there is that often you have to put, you know, 20 times the amount of nickel as the amount of palladium you've got. And so it doesn't actually solve the problem. <clears throat> I mean, without sounding partial, the reason the platinum group metals are used so much in spite of their prices is that they just do things that other things can't do. Yeah. So fuel cells you know you've got iridium on one side you've got um sorry electrolyzers and fuel cells iridium platinum um, palladium ruthenium they all go into the magic mixture which makes it possible to have the energy density that you need or the lifetime that you need and of course people want to substitute that you know we want to substitute that because we want every little atom of platinum to be doing the maximum amount of work in as many fuel cells as possible going on into the energy transition but, you know, and, and clever people have worked on this for since the discovery of platinum 200 years ago, you know. Um, so you, you can substitute up to a point. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, the point, and this isn't going to be popular with anybody, but um, the point that Phil was making. Um, no, I've lost it. It was just on the tip of my tongue. Sorry, it'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the refining pays for itself if you are doing you know, platinum group metals because they're so expensive. The problem is the more you thrift, the more complexity you add with lots of different metals, the more difficult it becomes to recycle, the more you erode those margins. So, I mean, the counter argument is put loads of platinum group metal in there, have it costing an absolute fortune, but make it easy to recycle. And so we get it back really, really quickly. But that is not a trend which I've managed to get anybody to actually buy into. <laughs> um, across the world but I still keep hammering this design for recycle please think about it if you want to you know sprinkle pixie dust in there that we've got to get pixie dust back out again afterwards yeah and I think this is so so Karen Hanhoy who joined us on on Wednesday morning she was talking about just think about making a cup of coffee and adding in that milk and actually what you're trying to do is to take the, the milk and the coffee granules and the water and actually separate them out at the end of the process. So Emma, last question, and um, perhaps if I may, with regards to the actual design process. And so we say, right, okay, I'm gonna make a fuel cell. Okay, so this is me being very, very naive with regards to all of this. Um, what are the driving factors with regards to that? Is it cost to the to the end user in terms of okay so how much or how do we actually how much do we sell it for and trying to keep that cost down because otherwise we don't think that anyone's going to want to buy it is it ability to recycle that fuel cell at the end of the day knowing that actually we want the i guess the kind of the core component parts to be able to be slotted in and slotted out so the bits that are going to wear out faster we can actually replace all of them 
Is it we're going to build this fuel cell using the most responsible raw materials as possible? So the materials that we know can be extracted and the initial processing done in a way that poses the least amount of threat to the environment. And I'm sure that there are a number of other factors in there as well. What, what are the kind of the driving factors that say, OK, this is actually how we're going to make this fuel cell? So from a, um, a very simple perspective, um, cost and performance. Yeah. How much does it cost to make and how well does it do its job? Um, more and more sustainability is coming into it. Are we using toxic materials? You know, does the processing produce waste? So everybody's now looking at their life cycle of their products, such as fuel cells, and saying, OK, which areas do we need to address to make to decrease the environmental impact? Because investors are starting to ask those questions. We need to be able to answer them. We need to be able to answer them anyway, irrespective of that. Now we've got the tools to be able to look at these things. We can actually start incorporating life cycle assessment into early stage research, into product development and say, look, um, you know, we have this choice of options. You've got so many choices at the beginning. We can e evaluate what the impacts are of our various different options in terms of the product life cycle. Um, but the whole, you know, is it recyclable? How complex is it? I don't think that discussion is happening as much as certainly I would like to see from the perspective of the refiner. So um, certainly internally, we can talk to people and, and say, you know, and guide their choice of elements, guide their um, choice of, um, yeah, product components to make them more recyclable. But um, one of the things which I kind of slid into my last slide, which we didn't really put up very much, was changing people's attitudes, changing the public's attitudes to what they want out of their products. So we want people to ask the question, you know, not only does it perform well, not only is it cheap, but is it recyclable? How easy it is to recycle? Can I please see that data? Is, you know, is there a, a stamp which says we can take this apart um, robotically, for example, or without people sitting disassembling mobile phones by hand and putting various different bits of waste and so on? So I think that's a, a social direction I, for one, would very much like to see in the future. Brilliant. Well, so with that, thank you so, so much, Emma, for coming and joining us here today and opening our world to the fact that there are more to sponges than we initially thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> but brilliant. No, thank you so, so much. And thank you also to Johnson Mathy for allowing you to show us your slides um, with, with um, their affiliation with regards to that as well. So absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. Brilliant. Fantastic. So that then takes us into our final talk that we have of this morning before you get to hear from Ludabine Rose and myself attempt to try and summarize um, some of the, the amazing content we've had from the 78 speakers who've already spoken to us here today. And that is not including the fabulous Julie who is about to come to the stage. Um, as you'll have noticed this morning, we've kind of been hopping around a little bit with regards to, okay, so one moment we're talking about you know, kind of deep social factors. The next minute we're talking about byproducts, and then the next moment we're talking about um, society as a whole, and then we're talking about platinum group metals, and then we're talking about Europe. And I think this is something here where, although it perhaps makes everybody's brains hurt, actually this is accentuating the complexity of what we're looking at at the moment. So there, there we go. That is my um, terrible fudge at saying um, this has been an interesting storyline we've been on this morning but I think it's great because it does truly make us think and so our last speaker that we have coming to our virtual stage uh, Julie if you want to hit that unmute button if you've got materials you want to share now is a good moment to go for it but I will encourage everybody to please put their hands together on the far side of their muted microphones for the fantastic Julie Shindal thank you very much Julie <laughs> and if you want to introduce yourself properly first that would be great and then crack on with what you want to say. Sure, yeah. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you. I'm pretty new to this group. I haven't attended this conference in the past, so it's nice to sort of dip in and, and see what the conversation looks like. Um, so I hope that uh, I will be able to hold your attention if I'm the very last speaker in a robust three days. That's quite a task, um, <laughs> but I will accept it with uh, bravery. Um, and um, I don't have any slides to share this morning. I'm just going to be speaking with you, um, which will hopefully also be a bit easier for everybody. 
Um, so yes, I'm Julie Schindel and I'm the senior manager for responsible sourcing at Levin Sources. For those of you who know Levin Sources, you're going to be like, who's Julie then? And I joined the organization in January, so I am a new face to Levin Sources. Um, I am here in Berlin, Germany, and my background for about the last 10 years has been really squarely in the space of how do companies source materials for their products with respect for human rights and the environment. But specifically, I am a human rights specialist. Um, prior to um, working at Levin Sources, I was a senior advisor at Shift, which is a leading organization on business and human rights, and uh, also at the Responsible Business Alliance um, back when they first created their secretariat a long time ago now. Um, and uh, before that, I had other careers in humanitarian assistance and journalism. So um, I've had a bit of a winding road, but always really the focus, I would say, squarely on human rights, which is also my academic background. So um, I guess uh, over the years, I've managed to gather quite a lot of, uh, rather a lot of sense of how do companies do business with respect for human rights, including in the minerals and metals sectors. Um, because I've been in a position in particular through industry association and also through advisory services to see the practices of a lot of companies, as well as governments, civil society, trade unions, other stakeholders. It's a very interesting lens to have. Um, and over the years, I've collected sort of quite a lot of impressions about where things are going, what practices actually make a difference in terms of improved outcomes for people and communities on the ground, whether in production countries and minerals and metals through the entire value chain through to end of life, as we were just talking about here in terms of recycling. Um, and I guess this morning, as I shared previously with Sarah and Rose, I was uh, going to allow myself to share a little bit of a story arc of some of the impressions I've had over those years, not least because I've just returned to a rather focused minerals and metals space after having spent the last five years or so uh, working on human rights due diligence across numerous industries. And um, I have rather, I, I'm rather um, struck by some of my impressions thus far that I thought might be in also interesting to share with others and, and some of my thoughts about um, what actually makes a difference um, for people involved, uh, whether at the mining level, whether at the smelter and refining level, transport, recycling, um, manufacturing, you name it, in the minerals and metals supply chains. Um, so I'll just share with you some of my remarks now um, and certainly welcome questions from all participants. Um, so obviously we're all aware that, you know, minerals and metals are at the heart of the just transition. And, you know, it's been certainly interesting to see this new name um, critical minerals here in Germany, obviously, um, it is now seen as a matter of national security and energy independence to make use of uh, green energy technologies, not least because of current conflict uh, in Ukraine, um, in addition to their obvious necessity to enable that transition to a greener and more just future. Um, and so in terms of um, my own story, um, when I started working in responsible sourcing. Back then we usually called it corporate social responsibility. There's all these names for these things. Um, it really felt like for many, many companies, the focus on responsible supply chains or responsible sourcing was just getting information. So let's find out who our suppliers are, you know, beyond tier one, that was big. Um, let's do a unified supplier questionnaire. Let's do a database to store that information in like a centralized standardized format. And let's do audits to verify what is in the questionnaires. Um, back then, um, you know, I used to give media interviews and I had to be fairly convinced of what I was saying. I felt it did make sense because step one in responsible sourcing, and this, I st this is absolutely still true, is knowing where you're sourcing from. This came up in the discussion about, I'll say, blockchain. I, so, um, and, and what kinds of impacts could be occurring to people and planet along the way? That's absolutely step one of being a responsible company, just knowing right? What's in my product? How did it get here? Um, so when I returned into that focused metals and minerals space uh, in January of this year by joining Love and Sources, um, I was curious where the sector was. And if I can be honest, I was kind of shocked uh, that so much of the focus still seemed to be on exactly the same actions as what I had seen when I first came in to the entire responsible business world, which was the real focus on, okay, let's do the supplier questionnaire, let's do the audit. You know, there's a real proliferation of industry standards and certification schemes, which are then audited against. Um, and obviously in this space, some regulation that is relevant for companies as well. Um, but I didn't still understand how all of these policies and processes actually improve outcomes for people or planet on the ground. 
how companies coming in seeking to align to a certain standard um, ensure that their actions on the ground are actually framed around the needs of local people and really their fundamental rights, which are framed in human rights language. I didn't see that connection between the actions companies were taking even now and improved outcomes for people. So we know that the mining sector has one of the longest track records in terms of considering impacts on communities related to its activities. Um, it's also one of the more regulated sectors subject to very specific requirements related to community impacts. Um, and to this day, just about a month ago, as reported by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, uh, Center the mining sector is consistently the most dangerous sector for community members who stand up for their rights. These are human rights and environmental defenders. This is a track record for seven years as tracked by the Human Rights Resource Center, but uh, it probably goes beyond that. Um, and to be frank, as I'm sure all of you do also find, I, I find this a troubling track record after decades of efforts. And I have personally known many, many people from business, from civil society, from government who have given tremendous efforts and investment to make the metals and minerals supply chain, including those critical minerals, more responsible, more rights respecting. So obviously the question is, you know, if, if I'm questioning some of the um, actions that I think continue to be taken by companies in terms of responsible sourcing of minerals and me metals, what's better then, right? What, what's, what's my alternative? I, I can't just complain, I have to offer a solution. That's always how I've been trained, including when I did advocacy at Oxfam. Um, as one green energy technology company recently asked us at Levin Sources, okay, fine, if, if we're not gonna be reliant on audits as the entirety of our due diligence system to demonstrate responsible sourcing, what's the alternative? What are the other tools in the toolbox? And you know, I had to really smile with sort of relief when I got this question, I was very happy with that. You know, it's been over 10 years, as we all know, since the UN guiding principles on business and human rights really set the global bar on what it means to do business responsibly with respect for human rights. The UNGP set out that very clear pathway for companies by articulating something that companies already do, and that is due diligence. And after a decade of efforts uh, to implement the UN guiding principles and also the relief they provide in terms of standards alignment, rather than sort of playing standard soup and new standards popping up, we know what that bar is, we can drive to it. Um, and it's aligned with OECD uh, guidelines for multinational enterprises. We also now have leading practices that demonstrate what is the appropriate role for verification tools like audits? You know, yes, we're not giving up on them, but they have a specific role. And more importantly, you know, what's the big picture about what companies can do to take steps to ensure that their products and services are made responsibly? And again, not just enforcing an outside standard on local people who maybe think that doesn't make sense for me, but really working with local people to make that product and service responsibly. I'll get on to more on that in a minute. I'm thinking back to what I heard Zach share with us. I, you know, I could go through a list of practices we've seen work, especially deep in the supply chain where you feel maybe as a company more downstream, well, I have no leverage, you do. <laughs> but I really wanna focus on one critical linchpin to it all that I've observed over the years as an absolute kind of make or break factor. And that's, I can encapsulate that in one word and that word is engagement. So, this word gets bandied around a lot. <laughs> what does it even mean? Um, when it comes to responsible sourcing, engagement means a conversation, a dialogue. In terms of stakeholder engagement, it means an invitation to discuss not just the presence of a policy or process on paper, but how it is implemented and challenges suppliers are facing to implement it, how they think about that stuff on paper and what is its connection to real performance, which is performance in this instance is actually improved outcomes for people and planet, not the existence of something on paper. And many companies say, um, fine, I mean, logically I follow you, but I cannot carry out a conversation with my 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 suppliers. That's the case for some of the very big downstream companies. And no, of course, of course that's not possible alone but here's the power of collaboration. And I know this topic has been addressed in the previous days. So collaborations, partnerships, industry initiatives, multi-stakeholder initiatives, dialogue platforms, you name it. Over and over, we have seen the power of collaboration to engage, to support, to push supply chain partners 
to rise to the standard that we expect of all companies to do business with respect for people and planet. And secondly, but no less important, engagement is also about engagement with potentially affected people. The people who could or have already experienced abuses of their fundamental rights in connection with your business, whether in your own operations or value chain, those of you who know the OECD multinational enterprise guidelines or the UN guiding principles will know exactly what language I'm using here. And this is about more than a questionnaire. This is a real conversation, you know, because of the pandemic, we've, I think, become particularly heightened to what is a real conversation as compared to an email exchange, a questionnaire, a please enter data in my database. And this conversation is usually held in collaboration with civil society organizations or trade unions who support and uh, speak as legitimate representatives of potentially affected people. That's the language from the standards. Experienced companies also know that you ignore the perspectives of affected communities at your own peril. If we wanna talk sort of hard knocks, why does this matter? Especially in the mining sector, we see direct ties between harms to communities because of mining projects and what we often refer to as material risks to mining companies, all the way up to the project having to close or end due to conflict with community. This research is nearly 10 years old. It is very clear it is not new. It should not be news to us that consultation with potentially affected people is a core part of ongoing due diligence and frankly, effective business operations management overall. Um, as a final point, um, I just wanna share one reflection that has been particularly uh, strong for me in the last few months since coming back squarely in the minerals and metals value chain space. Um, too often I have seen human rights due diligence categorized as just risk management. And it's like a, that just do no harm, that's the boring stuff, we've got to do that. But somehow, you know, like the real wins are gonna be when we like move the needle and do impact. And this is gonna somehow be different from ensuring that the company's impacts on people and planet are as positive as possible. So I'm not the first to say this, but given how much, you know, I've in the last just hour, I've seen us reference something like, for example, the sustainable development goals. I wanna say this really clearly because I strongly believe it to be true. The greatest single contribution companies will make to the betterment of human lives on our planet will be when the company's own footprint on people and the environment is a force for good. No amount of philanthropy or bringing a useful product to market, including a green energy uh, technology to market, can erase the profound harm companies could do, do do, when they fail to respect the rights of workers, communities, and environments impacted by their activities. So think about the tens or even hundreds of thousands of people and communities impacted by one large business and its value chain. And imagine that all those people and communities experienced positive improvements in their lives because of that company's actions. That is a huge opportunity. This is an opportunity for resilience, for being a company and a business partner of choice. And ultimately, as I think has been the focus of all of these three days, for companies to show real leadership in our time of this just transition. I'll conclude there and, and very happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Julie. Round of applause from, from all of us here. Absolutely brilliant. And um, I think as well, such great words to, to begin to actually draw to a conclusion. What's happened over the last five days um, um, of, this, of this meeting of minds, shall we say, and this collaboration, because I think that was perhaps one of your key messages coming through there is, is we truly need to collaborate and through that really listening to one another and trying to understand where everybody's coming from. Um, Zach, I don't know if you want to join me in on, on this discussion. I realize I've given you no warning at all. Do you have any reflections on what Julie's just shared with us? Only that I think it was brilliant. Um, I, I think, uh, I guess two, two things. Um, one's a slightly broader reflection around the mining industry. Uh, Many of you don't know, I wear a number of different hats. One of my hats that I wear is a, uh, is a dialogue forum in South Africa, which is uh, led, by, um, led by faith organizations with the mining industry as a kind of a safe space that they can have some, some of these dialogues. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I like to say I think it's quite an important piece of work. 
the safeness and the the neutrality of that space that it can be a place where people can come in have real disagreements um without judgment uh so i think that's i think breaking that down and getting that that right out to the community uh, sorry i'm now i'm now rambling along where i was trying to go with that was the Julie's point about engagement and dialogue is absolutely critical. And the complexity of doing that on a broad basis is, uh, is phenomenal. You know, we, as miners, two points, sorry, the one is that as miners, what we tend to do is go, cool, I've spoken to, I've spoken to a couple of my trade unions, and therefore, I've now ticked that box. I've taken care of that, you know. And and uh, Chris Chris Griffith, who was who was uh, uh, CEO of Platinum, is now he's now the chief executive at Goldfields. He he drew a really simple, really brilliant graph a few years ago. We were chatting and we were talking about this problem around uh, labor labor engagements. And he said, you know, we used to have a relationship between a company and their employees. And then in like the 80s, certainly in South Africa, we outsourced that relationship. We outsourced it to the labor unions. And now the relationship looks like that. And we don't know our employees anymore and they don't know us. And so the whole thing, you know. Uh, and so I think Julie's point of representatives of groups are not the same as groups. All right. And I think that that's, that's pretty critical. And then the second point is... Um, also to Julie's thing, but I think somebody else mentioned it earlier, is that mining comp my, the mining industry is painted with a single brush, all right? Uh, often, there may be different colors and different nuances in that, but often with a single brush. And, and I, the best example I can think of of that recently is uh, there was a, a situation in South Africa. Uh, Natasha Fulion, who is the chief executive at Anglo Platinum, they wanted to donate money to the Red Cross uh, towards their work in the Ukraine, a significant amount of money. And the Red Cross said, nope, we don't take money from mining companies. Now, you know, if I was going to look at a list of responsible mining companies, Anglo Platinum would be in that top little group. I mean, they really do, not perfect, but they do a lot. But because the industry gets painted with a single brush, I think it is important for all of us to be much more um, aggressively outspoken about bad actors and about bad examples, you know. And I, I think about the, the mining in Darwin that's just happened where, you know, uh, uh, several people who have a long history of uh, questionable activities stood up and spoke, you know. And as an industry, I think we need to be much, much stricter around, uh, around actively speaking out against these bad actors. So there's that dialogue, but there's also that um, conscious action, a, a conscious dialogue with the bad actors because we all get painted with that same brush. Sorry, I know that was a bit of a round trip. As I say, you can journey anywhere, but you get to the... Brilliant. Thank, thank you for that, Zach. Um, Julie, do you have any comments in return for Zach? And I, I think, I mean, one thing, Zach, that really resonate, resonated with me there is the mining sector is diverse. And do we hold ourselves to account or do we offer the stage, the platform to, to be honest, the same people who have been standing on it for 20 years, which can be immensely frustrating because we know that some of them have, well, have been doing things that perhaps aren't in line with where we want the sector to be today. Um, sorry, Julie, <laughs> over to yourself. Yeah, I, I feel like you're a fellow journalist here. That's quite a good question. Um, <laughs> so um, it, still, it still runs in my veins, this, this instinct. Um, I think two things come to mind when I was listening to Zach speak. Um, and one is a bit simpler to speak to, and then, and then I'll go to the second. The first one is um, in terms of facilitating that dialogue that is so critical to actually demonstrating uh, and enabling the company to be a true responsible business. Um, I agree that it's incredibly complex. I have seen many, many companies, uh, and this includes financial institutions as well, learn over the years, how do we do that then? Because internally we have no idea how to do that. Um, and that's certainly not something that we can finance alone. 
And so the most successful, really practical examples that come to mind for me are when companies join together. Um, I've seen very small groupings. I've seen very large groupings. They both have pros and cons. Um, and get connected with people who actually understand something called dialogue facilitation. Consensus building is also a really critical byword here. Um, and ensure that they have access to that expertise. I think companies sort of knee jerk, this maybe comes out of the era of maybe some more legacy approaches to sustainability reporting, for example, is they send out to a list of people they know, a questionnaire to tell them, what are the issues we should be concerned about? And I fully understand that this does not necessarily come from an evil place. <laughs> I have seen beloved colleagues do this over the years. But that's not what the expectation is, and that's not what is going to enable the company to have the perspectives of affected people that it needs to have. Um, so that's just a thought on that front in response to something that, that Zach raised. Um, I guess my answer is, yes, dialogue is complex, but it is possible, and we have a track record of doing it well. Um, so in certain instances. In terms of um, you, the second part of your question, <sighs> You know, who gets up on that stage? Do we give ourselves a pass and sort of pat ourselves on the back when we shouldn't be? Um, you know, what comes to mind when I hear that question is for me, again, really the tremendous assistance that we can find in the standard set by the UN guiding principles. Because finally, after so many years of just sort of a whack-a-mole game of standards created by, I don't know who, I, I don't mean to delegitimize anybody who set a standard, but admittedly it's a lot of bodies who sort of appointed themselves to, to write a standard um, with differing degrees of quality, I think we can all say, we have a really, really robust standard about what it means to be able to credibly say, we're doing okay in our efforts to be a responsible company. And that we would actually also begin to say, okay, fine. What, what does your performance look like, right? Because for years, the performance indicator was the presence of an audit. How many caps did you close? I cannot tell you the number of cap reports that I read that I could not credibly connect to outcomes for workers or communities. It was just procedural, but it didn't actually connect to then working conditions or you know, water access for communities who are adjacent to mining activities that are extremely water intensive and lower the water table. So that I think is very helpful in terms of, to me, having a very clear standard. Fine, if we wanna put somebody on a platform and say, they're demonstrating some leading practice and we'd like to learn from that, or they had a huge problem, but they're starting to learn how they can improve on that situation, which is probably more the reality that we would actually be able to have one shared view about, well, where are we trying to get to and what actually works? For me, that brings a tremendous clarity to have that rather than sort of every conference there's, as you know, Emma rightly said, kind of a sexy new approach that relates to responsible sourcing that we all of a sudden feel the need we need to spend a whole conference on. I think we have learned over the years that that doesn't necessarily lead to improved outcomes for people or the environment. And that's what this is all about. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Emma. Um, you've got Ludovine applauding away behind the, behind the scenes. Absolutely fantastic. And and yeah, and I think that this is a case here of um, in terms of people talking, in terms of people doing audits, ticking boxes, etc. Who cares if somebody has a policy or a procedure? Is what are you actually doing on the ground? Where is that impact? Where is that action? Where is that change that's happening there? Um, and, and that's the, the, the real focus point. So everyone, if I can invite you to please put your hands together for the fabulous Julie Schindel. Thank you very much, Julie. Brilliant. Fantastic. So that then takes us into the final session um, of not just today, but the full conference really. And what Ludovine and myself, with the help of Rose, of course, are going to try and do is try to summarize some of what we have heard over the course of the last week and then begin to sort of taking Julie's advice here, say, okay, well, so what? What do we actually do with it? Is this just yet another eight sessions worth of us all going, oh yeah, well, that was very interesting. And then this afternoon we can, we can go and get on with our lives. Or is this something that can act as one of those pebbles cast into that pond so we can actually instigate some of that change. And of course, in the past, we have managed to instigate various aspects of change, but what do we think um, this week is really all about? So um, Ludvine, I shall start sharing the slides my end, um, but I'm gonna pass across to yourself pretty damn quick.
quickly, to be honest, to say, OK, because these slides have been put together over the course of the last few hours whilst everybody has been speaking. And um, you should see the number of versions that have gone backwards and forwards where we've gone, oh, we need to add that in. Oh, we need to add this in. Um, it's been quite spectacular. So, Ludovine, if you want to, to come to the stage and I shall start sharing the slides and we will go into that final wrap up with regards to what we think we have heard this week. When we get to the end of this, all of our lovely speakers from this morning, um, if you are happy to stick around, we would love to get your critique on what we're saying. Did we get it right? Did we miss something? Do you think that any of what we're saying will actually make a difference? Or is it just another arm wavy nothingness that isn't really going to help anyone at all? And be harsh with us because we need this critical feedback. So going to the slides, um, Ludovine, over to your lovely self. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, for those of you who actually went full circle with us, you will recognize my uh, very colorful slides from the very beginning, um, because we, we did start by mapping where we've been these last uh, two years. This is the third iteration of the conference. In the meantime, there's been actions, but we are also right now in the process of really structuring the next steps for this movement to turn into an initiative and hopefully a real change agent on a, on a, you know, on a wide uh, significant scale. Um, could you skip ahead, please, Sarah? Thanks. This, this very busy slide is really a view of where we started, okay? We, we started with this um, recognition of the stakes, a clear call to action, and the fact that mining is intrinsic to all of these aspects. I want, I want to avoid using the word role because what's really come across throughout this week is that this role is evolving. It's also multidimensional. Um, and frankly, it seems to be at the moment um, really taking on different shapes and different colors for every stakeholder looking into it. And I think rather than, you know, bemoaning that confusion, we should celebrate it because out of this enormous complexity arises a lot of opportunity. And at some point, solutions really emerge from chaos. So um, this, is, this is really the, the, the view that we started with. And Skip ahead, please, to the next slide, Sarah. This is kind of where we positioned our mandate before all of these discussions. Um, as I said earlier, the, 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 come on, the scope of responsible raw materials is very much hinging on that interlinkage between criticality and responsibility. Criticality is not an option to do what we want responsibility has to factor in the need to respond to the criticality stakes. So they have to be balanced and better yet, they can improve each other along the way. And what I think you'll see in, in the next few slides is where we positioned our strength, which is the colossal diversity of the network and of the you know, connections that have been created around responsible minerals, uh, raw min materials, sorry, throughout these conferences. And the three pillars of action that we think are most relevant to this emerging organization. The first one is dialogue. The second one is sharing the knowledge and sharing the inputs um, that emerge from, from this dialogue. And the next step, very much in our view, is devising an advocacy platform that is informed by our deep sector knowledge, but also very independent because we represent every company, every stakeholder, every input, every discipline. In a way, it gives us a colossal margin of, of freedom. Um, I think perhaps, um, Sarah, if you want to recap on where the week has taken us, one thing that I would say that is absolutely clear is that the common foundation of every single discussion we've had has been those 
those three parameters at the bottom, the recognition of a climate emergency, um, the, the really the pervasive uh, value of the sustainability imperative, and the ESG expectations in the recognition that ESG is fundamentally a tool to achieve these objectives. So I think that has come across every single one of our discussions. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Ludovine. So, so moving into, okay, so what have we been hearing over the course of the week? And Ludovine, jump in here. These are some of the resounding words that we've had coming through. So earlier on in the week, we did, we ran some word clouds, we ran all kinds of collaborative tools, which were brilliant. Um, in terms of what does this look like, you can see everything would just get on with it. <laughs> we, we know what we need to do. We know that we're going to make mistakes, but we need to instigate instigate this action. Um, what about the business model? And there's been a resounding theme of that coming through today. So, so how do we actually do this thing called mining? And to be honest, what on earth do we mean by mining in the first place? Most people don't understand what it even is. Um, to ensure that this actually happens, things like we need that systems change, we need the change in the mechanics, etc. We also need to understand who are all of the different people involved with this and what, what truly is that shared value? What does value mean to those different individuals? What do they actually want to get out of this? And speaking to, to, to Julie's uh, final words there, how do you make sure that this really is a force for good rather than somebody being even perceived to be taking advantage of somebody else? So how do we deal with that? Bearing in mind that this is an incredibly complex situation and it involves on mass economic systems, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we make this happen? It is so easy, it would be so easy for us to go, oh, you know, it's all just too difficult. I'm going to go back to, to, to my life now and actually deal with what I can control rather than saying, well, which bits of this particular beast do I start nibbling away at? And not just looking at the threats that we can stop happening or that we can try and, and correct, but actually looking for the upside as well. All too often, I think, to organisations, especially when they're doing audits, for example, people are looking at that environment, social governance, and they're looking at the threats that hang off them and say, OK, have we managed to control all of those threats? Instead of also looking at the upside to say, hey, you know what? If we did this properly, there's huge opportunity out there to actually build something that is so much more exciting and better for everybody involved. So actually, rather than just saying, here's my level of compliance, let's just try and maintain that, then big tick in the box, actually taking a step back and going, well, let's reimagine that. What does this look like? So with regards to all of this, we've seen huge amounts of connection between everybody over the last week, okay? So we've had 64 talks and panel sessions. We've heard from 79 speakers. With regards to the diversity of those speakers, we've had people speak to us, and I will miss some of the countries out here, so my sincere apologies. We've had people speak to us from the Philippines, Australia, um, different parts of Asia, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, South Africa, all over Europe, we've, which includes Ukraine as well. Um, we, obviously the UK, Ireland, across into Canada, the USA and different parts of Latin America, including a number of um, very senior influential individuals from Peru yesterday. So this is something where we have intentionally tried to hear from as many different geographies around the world, um, amongst our speakers, we are more or less evenly split with regards to those who identify predominantly more on the female versus male side of things. So, of course, from a, a gender perspective, we've attempted to bring in diversity there. And then, as previously mentioned, we've also heard from people who um, really like mining. We've heard from people who really don't like mining. We've heard from people who use the products that are produced by the mining sector. We've heard from people who write the regulations that perhaps change how we do some of the things. We've, we've heard from people who fund different activities within the sector um, and a whole host of other individuals as well. It's been um, a really lovely journey, I think, with regards to hearing all of these different perspectives and also in each session as well, welcoming those perspectives into the room and say, I respect you for what you're saying. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I want to learn because I'm happy for my perspective to change 
because I want to make sure that this is settled in my own mind. So in terms of those creation of connections, that's really begun to happen. And I don't, I'm sure the same is for Ludovine and for Rose, but my inbox has just been exploding <laughs> with people saying, oh, you really need to introduce this person with that person. Um, and if we do nothing else at the course of this conference, then, then that is truly brilliant. So actually making those connections and, uh, and actually opening up those doors that otherwise people might not think were even open to them. And one of those areas, of course, is around deep sea mining. That's been one of the recurring themes that we've been uh, talking about during this conference all the way through. And that's a case there where really linking some of those different stakeholders together who never thought that they could talk to one another. They perhaps knew about one another, but they never thought it was appropriate for them to open that conversation. So, so that has been truly empowering, certainly um, for myself anyway, with regards to that. Other things as well, of course, that are immediately coming out of this, as mentioned yesterday afternoon, um, launched during this week, there is an edge of mine course um, focusing in on um, ESG within the mining sector. If you want to have those links, go for it. And that has been contributed to by previous Responsible Raw Materials conferences. Um, starting off in two weeks time, Rose, I think there is a 10 part seminar series that's being run by the Geological Society, um, which will feature a number of the speakers that you've already met met during the course of this week. So Pauline, you were saying yesterday, you don't know what you're going to do next week, because there's not going to be some free YouTube TV with all of us featuring. Well, don't worry, you just need to hang on for two weeks. And then we're back. Because every week we will be featuring on a Wednesday or a Thursday, um, with sessions here really looking at not just the geosciences role within mining, but the broader perspective. Um, also from a responsible raw materials perspective, we'll be there at PDAC. Um, so the big Canadian conference um, starting in June. And then, as mentioned yesterday, we will also be at Glastonbury, which is pretty damn cool, to be honest. Um, so we'll be there sharing um, the stand with the Geological Society at Glastonbury within the science area saying, OK, what do, what, where do we get our raw materials from? What do we need to be changing to make sure that we do this in a truly responsible manner? And how does this impact on the world? So as you can see here, a diverse area of, of different aspects that we'll be going into. So those are some of the things that have been happening, but let's just really delve into what Ludovine was saying now about some of the themes that have come out from this week. So here is the agenda, okay, that we have been looking at. So yes, yeah, so these are the 79 speakers that we've had over the course of this week. Um, and as you can see here, so, so eight sessions, so we're missing the number eight because we didn't want to cover up your names over here in the final one. Ludovine's going, oh, we missed it. Um, but in terms of, of what are some of those themes that came out from each of those sessions? And Ludovine, I don't know if you want to hop in here or do you want me to go for it? Sure. Um, to, to some extent, it, it's incredibly interesting how the, um, you know, the juxtaposition of different speakers from different backgrounds and actually looking sometimes at very different aspects of mining and the just transition and that equation actually seem to systematically come to coalesce around a shared problem, sometimes a shared solution. Um, and, and I think that that also is an indicator of how very much we need these roundtable formats, how we need to pull ourselves out of our silos, however reassuring they may be, um, to, to actually confront ourselves to this complexity. So just very quickly to, to go through, I mean, the first session very much focused on discovering the just transition um, concept and, and more importantly, um, how, how it reflects into each one of our disciplines and, and, and practice areas. The, the reason I sort of boldly entitled the second session setting expectations is because all of these speakers in some way, shape or form reminded us that mining does not happen in a vacuum. We are accountable to ourselves as professionals, to business uh, owners, i.e. shareholders, but also to a series of other stakeholders. So again, really pulling out that sort of external view and making, making a point of those, those vital connections. The third session was very much focusing on trust, but also what comes, what comes before trust, which is making ourselves vulnerable enough in our convictions, in the emotions that they can trigger, 
and in what we hope to contribute to the solutions development. Um, and it was a very striking um, session for me. I, I'm, I'm a lawyer in, by background. The reason people study law is generally because they want to understand the system. And seeing so many speakers say, we can, we can put the system on the table, break it open and start again, if we do it from a position of trust, is something that's incredibly empowering for many of the people who feel threatened by this change. So I thought that was a very important aspect. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you want to look at some of the other ones because we're viewing yeah. more into your territory there. <laughs> sure. So, so um, session three being vulnerable and actually saying, okay, how do we build that trust? Then into session four, and I think the reason why Ludabine's handed over to me here is we started off with the rocks, and of course, I'm I'm originally full disclosure. In case you haven't worked this out already, I'm originally a geologist. Um, and yeah, why do we go into geology? Um, again, I could be very self. Uh, I could be I could take the Mickey out of myself greatly, but I think that the reason why people go and study geology is because they want to understand the earth as a system that's why people want go into geology and when we're studying the rocks we're not just just focused on the rocks we're also looking at the interaction between people and the earth as well so um what we had here was um really seeing mining perhaps what is the role of mining within this system and actually and we'll show you some diagrams on this in a second but viewing mining and processing is perhaps one of the or the keystone within the circular economy and i'm being really grand about this as well and we'll, we'll explain this why i can see how going what does she mean by keystone we'll explain this to you in a second um on into session five um and this was then really saying okay well what does the system actually look like um and what are the mechanics of that system and how do we change how can we perhaps change some of this as well um and and with regards to that so um this is where we had our dinosaurs to the donut economics for example so dinosaurs meaning actually um, children in schools or whatever, they love playing with those dinosaurs, but at some point in time, everyone then decides that mining is horrible. So actually what's going on there, coupled with the fact that we need to be thinking about um, the full blown economic system um, and, um, and Ludovine's revolution. So the kind of the fact that she's in France right now, perhaps filtering into her general psyche. Um, on into session six, which is actually where we started off the morning session, perhaps, um, which was around information. So what information do we need to be collecting in from people? How do we have respect for that information? How do we view that information? How do we collect it together? Into session seven, which is where we hit the shared value. So what does that truly mean? So as Julie was saying, what does everybody actually want to get from all of this? And they're going to be different things. So how do we view that and how do we respect that as well? So what, what does that look like? And then finally into today's session, so session eight, and you can see what Ludabine's done here is she's gone, woohoo, <laughs> we've got the same themes coming through again. So I think that the theme for session eight, as has been noted here, is collaboration. So actually, how do we come together? How do we share these ideas? And that collaboration is, of course, shown where we've done some fudged <laughs> mapping back to the themes of the other sessions. So Antoine and Lizelle, um, Nizel, sorry, um, talking about perhaps information, for example, plus a whole host of the other areas. Johannes then really talking about, okay, yeah, what do we mean by the just transition? And what does that mean perhaps in the European context? Um, across into Phil, so saying, okay, yeah, what does this system look like? Where do the byproducts, et cetera, come in? And probably a little bit of number four in there as well. Um, Zach, of course, addressing a number of those different areas. Um, uh, Emma, again, coming across into those sessions four and five, and then finally Julie coming through into that, okay, what do we mean by that shared value? Now, we could carry on doing this mapping all day, couldn't we, <laughs> Ludovine? But it just shows that there have been those strands that have come through the course of the past week, which have been great. And also what this means is that anybody who wants to use this material the mapping's all there. So if you need to construct, I don't know, three videos that you need your students to watch, for example, to then write an essay on, they're all there. All the material is there to inspire that thought and also get, you know, listen to people who disagreed with one another as well, because there have been lots and lots of different points of view over the past week. So moving from that into the next area. So, so what, what do we do with this shared knowledge? And Ludovine, do you want to come in on this? I, I do, because I think one of the elements that's really important here, and this was mentioned in one of the panel sessions previously, is that there is a community forming around these discussions and these ideas. And, and it's a, 
it's critically important that this community also not only um, projects everything that we've heard, but if we are to act, you know, in line with with all of these um, ideas and 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 options, um, I think it's important to build a mandate that is legitimate, um, and that's my governance hat right there on. Um, so what we what we have here is really our proposals for for first outcomes, really in in the sphere of knowledge. The first one is that the, the conference itself has generated the talks, the recordings, the abstracts. There is already a colossal pool of information there. But okay, the next step is how do we move that to, you know, synthesis, a synthetic, you know, presentation of something that really moves the dial, that, that moves the debate forward. Um, and that's where we thought, well, the conference report. Uh, which is will be our inaugural conference report, should really hinge on this notion of changing the business model. It's come across in every session that what we're changing here is not just how we do mining, how we organize this or that process. No, it's actually the entire structure of how we position this business and how it interacts with the world. So we're going to be pulling from all the talks and, and all the panel discussions the, the elements that have come to the fore about this business model, how to rethink it, what are the proposals that we've heard, how do they perhaps work together or where do they actually contradict each other? Because hopefully that's the basis for the next set of discussions. And in terms of really a, a second outcome, perhaps more in the medium term, um, is an analysis bit focusing on ESG ratings. We had. ESG ratings were raised throughout the conference, not just because Elon Musk was dumping on them on Twitter, um, but because they are almost a, a confusion in this important debate. What are ESG ratings looking at? Why do we use them? Why do we feel they fail us? And more importantly, are we really using them in the way they're supposed to be used? And if we're not, okay, what do we want to use instead? So all of these questions, rather than saying ESG ratings don't work, okay, so let's think about how they can work, how they should work, and how they will work. And that is perhaps where we see a, a valuable bit of analysis that can come from these discussions and the connections we've made, again, to shape the future of the discussion. Great, thanks for that, Ludovine. So with that, of course, we've got the conference. We've also got these uh, these four areas as well, which are already being churned out as tangible actions into then the conference reports of the changing business model. Um, and we'll share some information on that right now. And then the final, the final aspect that we've got on the desk at the moment is around really challenging those ESG ratings. We've already had engagement with some of the world's um, largest investors, okay, so the users of those ESG ratings. Um, we're increasingly managing to get hold of the ESG ratings organizations themselves. And then of course, we've got interaction with the mining companies as well. So how do we bring all of that together to do exactly as what, uh, what Ludovine said? So those are some of our ideas we've got at the moment. We don't need to own this. We just need to kickstart this discussion and chuck the pebble into the pond. So this is not by no means an ego trip or anything like that. This is us just trying to kickstart the discussions and say that's a massive lever that needs to be pulled that can actually change something. So the final imagery that we will leave you with before we open for discussion and everyone can then go and get on with their weekends, which I'm sure you'll be glad to do, um, is this, this concept of mining as the keystone, which I sure, <laughs> we said earlier on, thought, okay, well, what does that actually mean? Well, this came out in some of those talks that we had on Wednesday, so very much midweek in conjunction with the circular economy. So, um, and, and this diagram has been put together this morning uh, during the presentation, okay? So it's a little bit scrappy and there are probably some spelling mistakes, but let's just go with it and let's just test it. So if you've got this, this funnel of information that is coming into the circular economy, yes, we still need to be able to mine those raw materials. Despite various reports that have been published on the BBC, et cetera, earlier on this week, we do not have enough material in circulation at the moment for us to be able to generate the infrastructure and the technology that we need in order to be able to us to actually just survive as normal let alone go through the just transition 
the only way we'll be able to survive with just the material that we have in circulation right now is, and I'm going to point at that elephant in the room, a serious reduction in global population. Now, obviously, we don't want that. So therefore, we need to be able to add more material into this circle in a responsible manner. So that then comes into this world of mining and processing, because really, the, when we say mining, we're not just talking about digging material out the ground. That would be pointless because nobody needs that raw material. Well, in some cases we do, but in the majority of situations, you have to be able to process it. So when I say mining, I am meaning mining and the processing. OK, I'm just being lazy and not talking about the processing side. So if you've got this mining and processing chunk in this circular economy, that is the info, that is the material that goes into manufacturing. And then I've said advanced manufacturing, because, of course, as we know, depending on what you're if you're building a car, there are lots and lots and lots of different steps that that needs to go through that probably involves the material doing a couple of laps around the world as well. So we need to be thinking about those supply chains. So you've got your manufacturing, you've got your advanced manufacturing, somebody then uses whatever it might be, that phone or that pen or whatever it is that you're making, then hopefully somebody mends it. Okay, so this is the bit where we say, okay, I'm very, I'm, actually I don't have a washing machine, to be honest, in my little off grid hut, because that would use way too much energy. Um, but say, for example, I have a washing machine, and one bit of it decides to disintegrate or just wears out, how do I replace that component part to make sure that that washing machine lasts 20 years instead of the 10 that is currently on the warranty or whatever it is for that washing machine. So how do I mend it? But then, of course, we get to the point where we, we do need to say, well, you know what, as the user, this is now waste to me. It has no value to me, but it might have a value to somebody else. So that then goes into the waste sorting and that then comes back into this processing bit. So this is the recycling bit of that loop. Now, have we missed things in this interpretation of the circular economy? Of course we have. We've missed lots. And in fact, the main bits that we've missed. So this is drawn from the perspective of mining. And the reason why so many mining people draw the circular economy like this is because often it's just drawn as a circle. And everyone says, well, where's the input? Where's the input to it? So we're going to stick a big input arrow in here. Well, the real circular economy is actually all about collaboration because it's not just mining that adds in raw material or raw ideas to all of this. When it comes to things like manufacturing, et cetera, exactly as Emma was saying, how do we design the products that we need at the end of the day? What about how do we decide which materials we actually need? Are we thinking about things like those supply chains? And then into the use, what about our own behaviors as individuals? We're all being told at the moment, in order for us to be able to achieve a 50% reduction in, in emissions by 2030, if we switched off every coal fire power station, the burning of every single bit of oil and gas, we wouldn't do it. We need to change the way we eat. We need to change the way that we behave. We need to change the way that we travel, for example. So how do we change those, how we use these materials? So the individual behavior in terms of mending. Yep. Yeah, so how long do we actually use these bits of infrastructure, these bits of kit for, and then into the recycling. So how do we actually go about sorting out all of those materials? And where we do have to put something into landfill, is it really landfill or is it long-term storage? By saying, okay, we can't at the moment recycle those plastic films that you get on some food packaging, but that doesn't mean to say we won't have invented the technology to be able to recycle it in 10 years. So let's remember where we put it. As someone who started out life as an exploration geologist, it's all about saying, OK, the Earth, which was formed 4.56 billion years ago and then went through huge sorting processes, because that's what we've got with the concentration of those minerals and metals. And so an exploration geologist, what we do is we work out where stuff is in the ground. At the moment, we're creating landfill and we don't necessarily, depending on where we are in the world and the regulations, etc., we don't necessarily know where the stuff is that we're putting in there because we might want to go back and mine it in the future. So, again, this is very much a conceptual model. But, you know, do we talk about it like this and do we talk about it in terms of collaboration and respect for one another as well, because we're bringing different things to the party? So with that, I'll hand back to Ludovine for final words and then we'll open up to our final discussion. And that will be it. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um... I think really the final word is, is we should continue as we started. Um, the reason the slide is up here again, although you all know all of our connection mm -hmm. details, 
is because the the strength and the value of what we're trying to shape here lies in every single one of you sending us those messages, talking in the conferences, the amazing comments that we get in the chats, by the way, thank you, Aldo, for, for your feedback, because we're going to consider it particularly in shaping the, the next uh, events. All of this is actually what makes responsible raw materials perhaps a little special, but also very powerful. And so my final word would be, be in touch, let us know. The whole point here is to say these things that perhaps don't sound so great on the usual stages or don't even get to the usual stages because they need to be said. Um, so that's more my call to action to everybody out there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ludovine. And as well, you don't need to come to us. We will come to you. So to all of you who have been saying, hey, can you come and speak at our event that's happening in two weeks time or whatever? Where absolute possible, the answer is yes, because we need to be able to engage in as many of those discussions as possible. And if we can't do it, we'll find you someone who can. So brilliant. So with that, thank you very much, Ludovine. I'm going to give you a round of applause. And I think we need to give Rose a massive round of applause, by the way. Big, 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 big round of applause to the fantastic Rose Clark, who started off on this journey as an intern three years ago. Um, so it was all because of, in fact, it's all Rose's fault. There we go. Let's lay it at your feet, Rose, uh, for all of this happening, because to be honest, if Rose hadn't come to us and, and said, hey, I need to do a two week internship on something. Um, and then not that COVID has been a good thing at all, but that has because COVID came in, we had to switch up that idea really, really quickly. And thus the first ever Responsible Raw Materials Conference was born. Um, so brilliant. Thank you very much, Rose, for uh, for making all of this happen. There we go, Rose. Brilliant. <laughs> Cool. So just, I think, in closing with regards to this, we've still got our fantastic speakers from this morning. And I realise that we've just thrown a huge amount of information out there. It's still very much spinning around my head. Um, Julie, perhaps if I can come to yourself first, give me a big thumbs down if you want me to go to somebody else first. <laughs> OK, awesome. Julie, perhaps if I can come to yourself first and just get your reflections on, on all of this. And then, Phil, perhaps if I go to you next. Sure. Um... Yeah, so I mean, uh, well done for attempting to put together that summary. Always very challenging. <laughs> um, lots and lots of content to package up. Um, I think the two bits that spoke to me the most about what I what I saw you share um, was it, it piqued my interest, but also made me want to ask a tough question, which is probably a reflection of my personality mm -hmm. um, around the ambition to uh, keep building on the momentum of this group and these conversations to be a space that fosters dialogue and exchange that actually makes a difference. Uh, and I think where I wanna sort of put the tough question back to all of us that I think needs to continue to be our measuring stick in all the work we do is, okay, how is this actually making a difference? You know, we have all been to so many conferences. There are so many venues for talking about what's going on in the sector and how it's responsible and the latest thing. Like there's no dearth of um, events or I'll say it maybe generously dialogue platforms that I wouldn't really consider true dialogue platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would certainly want to challenge everybody in this group if we're going to be part of that effort make sure it's actually different in the sense that it's actually getting us somewhere because I keep coming back to that rather tough premise that I shared with you in my remarks, which is I've spent 10 years, well, nearly 10 years, not focused entirely on minerals and metals. I've just come back and I'm seeing the same practices from 10 years ago that, that lead to the same sort of subpar outcomes. That's a very, as Zach says, very broad brush. That's not fair to everybody, but I think there's certainly room for improvement um, in the one sense you can say that's a quite negative critical message. I would like to say, look, there's a huge opportunity then. Um, the other piece, which is sort of smaller that certainly piqued my interest was this remark about ESG ratings. I do a lot of work with financial institutions, including those who do ESG ratings, those who develop them, those who are subject to them, those who use them, uh, who are also financial institutions. Um, that's a very, very interesting subject matter. Uh, Zach, I saw your comments. I think that 
there's a lot to be said in terms of where do those ratings come from? What legacy practices do they reflect that we can say at this point do not have evidence to support them that they actually lead to performance improvements? Again, based on the performance indicator that would set improved outcomes for people and environment as, as the performance indicator as compared to the presence of a policy, the presence of an audit, et cetera. Um, but it's certainly something that there has been a very extensive conversation already on many levels uh, with ESG uh, ratings and rankings institutions. It continues to evolve. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. But again, I would just caution companies who feel subject to all of this and going, I'm being pulled in every direction all the time. This is horrible. I would agree that is kind of horrible. And um, what I think, again, is useful for me, at least, I keep going back to that guiding light set by the UN guiding principles. Because if you're worried that there's going to be it's whack-a-mole again of like a new ESG rating that I'm going to be subject to, do that standard, do the UNGPs, which is the same as the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which is the, the really aligned to the new forthcoming regulation out of the EU, you're gonna be okay. But that's the standard you gotta to go to, not some of the legacy standards that I think we've seen swimming around in the space. So that's my thoughts. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Julie, fantastic. And you see Ludovine applauding you there, <laughs> brilliant. Phil, do you want to come in on this discussion and then we'll go to Emma? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think, as, as Julie said, the real, real sort of take home for me is, is opportunity. It really feels like there is an opportunity to do things better here and for a bright future. Um, listening earlier to Johannes talk about Europe and how you know, they'd abandoned mining in the 80s and now are, are coming back to it and there's an opportunity to do things better. Well, from my perspective of technology metals, that's fantastic to hear because they are a neglected commodity that gets very little attention. And this is you know, an opportunity to to do things better and to really build them into uh, future mining consideration. Um, also just hearing all of the, the people talking about, you know, uh, social involvement and getting, getting communities really involved in it and seeing the benefits for them. Um, I think that's a really positive step and, and something that it's, it's wonderful that you, you're drawing attention to it through this conference. Awesome, thank you very much, Phil, brilliant. Emma, how about yourself? Um, and then we'll go to Antoine. I'm feeling a bit as if I don't have anything unique to say at this point and uh, really appreciative of everybody else's inputs because it's been a really eye-opening experience. Um, this is a unique forum for me um, and I just am overwhelmed by what you're trying to do in not only changing what people do but changing the way that they think and there can be nothing more valuable than that so I can only just sit here and applaud what everyone's doing, what people are saying, thinking and trying to do. Awesome. Thank you very much, Emma. That means it means a lot. <laughs> so thank you very much. Antoine, how about yourself? Um, and then we'll go to Johannes. Uh, I mean, maybe on, on, on the discussion itself, I think that, that, that for me, one of the key messages, how do we echoing what the debate that's going on between on the ESG sustainability shot value, I mean, all this, uh, you know, like uh, acronym or, or, uh, or, or conceptual war which you know fights is, is i think trying to see how we can put it back to the you know from the perspective of people which was i think what you know was said what julie says i mean gngp is i mean it's been done by by lawyers so obviously you can't understand it at the end but if you want if you want to take it back to you know it's take the perspective of the people you're affecting take the perspective of like a community member who is going to be you know very vulnerable or the perspective of the worker and See, try to you know to understand in a in a very meaningful manner what they are going through, etc. And I think that you know that you can dumb it down, but after like making it work is, is difficult. And and I think the, to me the challenge is how do we bridge this gap? Is how do you bring these you know these voices to the ESG, and how do you then also mean, make these these indicators meaningful to the people? Because that's a conversation that I think is you know, completely disconnected. And I think there's that bridge. I don't see it being built uh, very often. I'm not saying it doesn't exist uh, because I really I'm, I'm, I'm only my, my prism, but, but I think there's a big gap here. Now, as, as to how this group can be useful, you know, for all it matters, I mean, Zach and I are going to connect next week and we didn't know each other. So I think it's just a, a little bit more of, 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 you know, a nice, nice way of connecting. And, and of course, hopefully, hopefully we can we can broaden that because the, the more sobering thing is that it's a self-selected audience and, and uh, many of the, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, 
challenges is those that are, I mean, you don't have to be here to be doing good things, of course, because no moral judgment, but uh, clearly the motivation to do something is, is really important. And, and uh, yeah, I hope we can go to the, those that are being silent and, and in, but interested or those that are you know, opposed and, and but needs to change, need to change. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Antoine. Fantastic. And I'm so glad that you and Zach are connecting. That's great. Um, um, Johannes, let's come to yourself uh, next. Sorry, Zach, let's come to yourself next and then we'll go to Johannes. Uh, yes. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, I totally muddled that one up. Johannes. Yeah, goes start first. with Johannes. Yeah, go with Johannes first and then we'll go to Zach. We'll do it in okay. alphabetical order. Well, for, first, big congrats to... Um, to uh, Sarah and Rose. I mean, I think it's excellent that you're accumulating all of these talks that people can go back and, and look at later because education will, will always be a part of it. I think um, my takeaways are that um, the quality of the permanent two-way engagement between mining and others will define our future. And I think that's a, a bit of a message I've heard from, from people today as well. Um, I'm not at all worried about the byproducts or the technology metals. Um, society will have all the mineral resources it deserves. Then we can have all the questions about, well, you know, how do we want to produce them? You know, uh, how do we want, want to uh, sort of uh, make sure that we're, we deserve the best? Um, and I completely agree with the sentiment of just get on with it. Um, and I want to support what we've heard today about, you know, we need to get back to speaking the language of concrete outcomes for the people affected. And I think that um, often enough, this industry might be held to standards of, that are met by other sectors, but often enough, those standards might really just be checkbox exercises as well. Um, so on the provocative side, I, I wonder, it may it may mean that mining companies have to be courageous enough to um, not respond to some of these other demands and simply come forward in a consistent, permanent way. Here are the real concrete outcomes we are having for our people. And, you know, have the courage to let some of those other demands unmet for a while. Great. Thank you very much for that, Johannes. Brilliant. Zach. So glad Johannes went first because he said it better than I could, and that, that was perfect. I um, I think I think I think as a as an industry we face two uh, we face a bunch of big dangers, but I think in this conversation we face two big ones. The one is that ESG ratings and and these policies and structures and things and whatnot uh, end up being greenwashing and rainbow washing. And uh, I'm going to do something enormously unfair. And Julie, I'm going to apologize ahead of time, which is the, the OECD, the UNGP, all of these things have, have the very best of intentions, but they are incredibly Eurocentric. They're Eurocentric, they're Northern Hemisphere centric, they're Western world centric. And the world is different in different places. And so I think Johannes's point of, you know, find our space, do our best, do what we believe to be the most ethical things that we can do, and then show them in, in a way that shows all, you know, opens our kimono, shows our, our, uh, our whole view of who we are and what we're doing. Um, and then call out companies that aren't doing that, you know, that are obfuscating things, that are hiding things, that are only showing bits. If we do that, then we will move forward in this clumsy negotiation. Uh, if we're willing to try and do our best, our thing that we believe to be most ethical, most genuinely good, uh, then slowly the world will move forward. And slowly we will begin to align towards those common goals, towards that uh, common ethical and moral compass. Great. Thank you very much for that, Zach. Um, now, I can't I can't then finish rounding up the conference by totally ignoring that question that you posed to Julie. Uh, Julie, do you want to come in on that? And then I'll go to the Divine. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. I, uh, in a way, I don't disagree with you, Zach. I, I think this is an interpretation question, because to me, the, the power of 
what the guiding principles articulate is specifically around that issue that I tried to hone in on in my remarks, which is about the stakeholder engagement. I mean, that's like the fancy term for it, but basically you're, you can't demonstrate that you're doing business responsibly if you just kind of go ahead and like implement a bunch of standards that, that you think are relevant and, and say that's it. And so, you know, I have looked at hundreds of companies' practices on these things. And if I don't see evidence that what they're doing is shaped around whatever affected people are telling them in terms of what the needs are and how their fundamental welfare and dignity is being impacted by this company's activities, that's not demonstration of responsible business. So, so that's what I'm looking for. And I think frankly, this is kind of a misinterpretation point. I had the honor of working with the folks who wrote the guiding principles and I know that was the guiding light in it. So I think we don't need to get into a discussion about this standard or that standard. The point is, I think we absolutely agree. This is not about coming in and imposing some external standard. This is the point around ensuring that the steps that the company takes to do business responsibly are framed around what are the needs of the people who are affected by the business? And, and at the end of the day, exactly, I think as Johannes, I kind of liked your little courageous point there at the end, said, look, you're gonna get maybe hit with a bunch of different standards. Let's focus on what the actions you have taken to improve outcomes for people and planet, fini, you know? And uh, I think that's really where we coalesce them here at this point. Great, thank you very much for that, Julie, brilliant. Um, so just in closing, Ludwig, any final words to share with everybody? And then I'll go to Rose. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you to all again for adding so much. Um, this may be a pet obsession, but I think it it's also a red thread that we've seen throughout our discussions today. Um, accountability. And I, I realize that when people hear accountability, they think of it as a punitive concept. Accountability also necessarily means empowerment. You can't hold someone accountable if you haven't given them the space, power, and capacity to do what you're holding them to account for. So I, I view a lot of these discussions as a call to action, but also a call to accountability. Accountability of ourselves, and I know I said this yesterday also, but also holding others accountable on the basis of what we have discussed or agreed as shared values. And that's where I, I think I, I very much uh, meet Julie's point. Um, guidelines and standards are tools. They're tools to define accountability mechanisms. Let's use them. And if you're using them, say what you do and do what you say. And frankly, if we start with that, you know, we'll be already a long way towards a lot of solutions being developed or more importantly, implemented for positive outcomes. So yeah, the lawyer view, but still useful. <laughs> we'll take it, Ludovine, we'll take it. Brilliant. Rose, any final words? Thank you. I, I'm going to start this by zooming all the way back out and saying firstly thank you to you Sarah because you've made this work and allowed these threads through all the different the all the different sessions to work and for them all to come out. I think Graham has said in the chat that this is a really great forum because we jumble everybody up and nobody is an expert in everything and we've had this conversation throughout the week of you know the generalist versus the expert and things and I think there's a there's room for both, but it can be difficult to, to get communication between those two different types of people. And I really like the fact that this forum allows that. And a lot of that is due to your hosting. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, big claps for Sarah, because you are fantastic and keep this going. Um, and I think, yeah, to keep it really short and sweet, let's just do it and move forward. And I think that's a nice sentiment to go into the weekend with. Brilliant. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so, so much, Rose. Thank you to all of you who have contributed to this past week and also will be contributing going forwards as we take action, we make that impact and we change the world. So let's get on and just do it. So brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely rest of your week. The lights have gone out for me here in Scotland, which is a trigger to say shut up because the Internet's about to go down. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. You've been truly amazing. See you all soon. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>